Welcome to Films from the Phantom Zone, your podcast about failed and forgotten comic book movies, where we watch a forgotten superhero movie and decide, does this belong in the Phantom Zone or out and about for everyone to rewatch and remember fondly? But today, Birdo, or let's start from the beginning. My name's Ronaldo. I'm your host, and I'm joined with my friend, Birdo. So today we're doing another review. We are doing The Suicide Squad. Yes, the DC movie. The Suicide Squad. The not to be confused sui- with Suicide Squad. Right. Which is not a good movie. Horrible couple titles, I think. For a variety of reasons. It, no, it's, <laughs> they're good titles. I'm just saying, like, in conjunction, when you put them next to each other, you're like, what is the deal? And so here's what we're going to do, I figure. Because, like, four months ago, we actually watched Suicide Squad, the 2016 movie. Yeah. Because we were watching... We were just watching every movie. We were watching the DC movies. because we were watch- Justice League. Yeah, because we want to watch Justice League. And so we put it on... And I was like, oh, we should do a bonus episode on this and we should record it now and then we'll just release it like leading up to Suicide Squad. I mean, obviously we didn't do that. So I thought what we could do, I think we should talk about regular Suicide Squad first for a little bit. Okay. And then I want to go over all of like these characters because there are 15, I think I counted, Suicide Squad members on this new movie. Okay. Uh, And they're all like deep cut characters like obscure like yeah none of them are original although two of them are sort of original we'll get into it i think i know who you're talking about yeah i thought we could do as usual kind of review the movie our opinions without spoiling it and then we'll talk spoilers like towards the end that way if you haven't seen this movie yet then you can just kind of stop us then yeah. right if you listen to any of our other bonus episodes you kind of know the yeah we've done a couple other reviews. of reviews we did a review on wonder woman 1984 we did black widow I want to say we did one more. Oh, and like Zack Snyder's Justice League. Yeah. But that one was like long. It was that, a one long was, movie. that one was like an event. <laughs> cool. So let's get right into it. So this is The Suicide Squad. It is in theaters right now or on HBO Max because that's for about 30 days. Right. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I actually watched this movie twice already because oh. uh, we watched it last yeah, night. You and did then watch I, it today. I watched it today also. So first of all, WB might be one of the worst entertainment companies in terms of like they just do stupid things. They're just structuring their franchises. Yeah, they just get in their own way a lot. And they have no right to because they have some of the best IP. You know, like they have Yeah, if you watch Space Jam, they showed off every IP. They exactly. Had. And that's a movie I want to wa- you you saw it, right? I saw it. I wasn't a fan. I've but... heard so such many bad things and I'm like dying to see it. But like come on, like the Warner Brother cartoons like Bugs Bunny in them. Yeah. And you don't utilize like you have the whole any DC universe. Like when Marvel was playing with scraps, with the box of scraps, you know, from the leftover characters that they had, and they made like the most successful yeah. fucking they franchises built of the all MCU time with a box of scraps Literally. in the cave. And you guys have the greatest characters ever: Batman, Superman, Wonder, Wonder Woman. Woman, Flash, the whole Justice League. You have the, the most famous comic book characters. Ever. Ever. Like, they're more popular than Except most. Except for, like, Spider-Man. Yeah, I think we talked about this. Is like, yeah. pound for pound, DC's got more firepower. Yeah. Harry Potter franchise. The Matrix. Like, and they make such bad decisions. And one... Every time. So, the 2016 Suicide Squad movie was not very well received. We're about to get into it. And so, when this movie is announced, The Suicide Squad with James Gunn, First of all, when they got James Gunn, it was because James Gunn was, like, famously canceled. And he got these, fired from Disney. Disney fired him. And it, you know what it was is because uh, James Gunn is outspokenly like a liberal. And during the whole last administration, he was tweeting a lot of, like, things about Trump, as a lot of people were. Most celebrities right? were. Yeah. A lot of people were. He was not a... It's very divisive. Let's just say that. Yeah. It's not, it's not put, to put it mildly. Yeah, yeah. For, yeah, exactly. This is not a political podcast. <laughs> yeah. What I'm saying, very divisive, right? And so he was outspoken. And then like right wing internet trolls started like pointing out some of his earliest tweets from like a decade ago yeah. when he was like young and edgy and making like rape jokes. And like well, he was also working for a company that like made like movies with that type of humor, too. I- Oh, 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 you mean, like, he was making, like, very, like, R-rated yeah, movies. Like, that was, that was yeah. just his thing. Yeah. And it, he had already apologized for those tweets before even being hired by Disney. Sure. <laughs> but because, like, now it's in, like, the forefront. These guys were, like, really bringing it up. Yeah. You know, Disney was very reactive, as a lot of companies would be, and, like, <laughs> let him go. And everybody... Marvel Studios was not happy about that. No. 
Oh, Kevin and, Feige was pissed. The uh, entire cast of it, Guardians pissed. Dave Bautista said he wasn't going to come back. Yeah. Disney, and there are conspiracy theories about this, <laughs> that Disney just did that knowing that they were going to rehire him after everything cools off. I don't know about that, but I, he I, was fired I for I think like, Disney had to be convinced. Maybe. I think it was very reactive. But he was fired for like six months before they brought him back. And in that time, DC like scoops him up and is like, obviously, you're a genius and we want you to like make, he is. He make, is a genius. make a movie for us. They offer him anything. Yeah. They, they wanted him to do a Superman movie. They said, what do you want? Do you want Superman? Do you want Batman? Like, what do you want? And he said, Suicide Squad. And it makes sense because this is his brand. It's like, this totally is, his stuff. This movie is so James Gunn. It's his favorite source material, basically. He's a big fan of the Suicide Squad comics. This is what he wants to do. And so they're like, okay, you can do whatever you want. Obviously. Which is not a thing that Warner Brothers was really known for doing. See, okay, here's the thing, though. They said that. I don't believe it. I don't believe that they told him that they can do whatever he wants. I think they gave him some stipulation. But he got the most free reign he got more, since Zack so, Snyder and like Man of Steel. Yeah, because after Man of Steel, they were like, all right, we need to rein yeah, you back a dur- little. During BVS, they're like, Whoa, what is going on here? And that's when they started kind of wrangling him in, yeah. And making his movies worse. Exactly. And we've talked about this ad nauseum. So, yeah. real quick, we did a Wonder Woman review. We did a bonus episode on Man of Steel, BVS. Justice League as like a regular episode because it's like a failed movie now because uh, it's been replaced. Yeah, that one was like a technicality. Yeah, sure. Because yeah. <laughs> uh, for us, it's been replaced by Zack Snyder's Justice League, which we did a review for. So we've talked about this a lot. We don't know if WB is replacing that yet. It, that's still up in the air. It's up in the air. And we can get into it because there's evidence in both ways. But So they give him free reign. They said, you can kill whoever you want. You want to kill Harley Quinn? You can kill Harley Quinn. That's and a- he was like, uh, <laughs> maybe I won't do that. I I, sw- I I don't believe they said that, but that they said that they said that. It was a whole thing. So anyway, so he wants to make a Suicide Squad movie, and that puts him in a pickle because they made one of those, and it was very unpopular, and it was not very good, right? So what do you call it? What do you do? And a WB exec at the time said it's going to be a total reboot. Those were his words, total reboot. And it's this not. Is, this is straight up a sequel. If you're yeah. wondering, because two years of me being like, what the fuck is this? You know, and I was very frustrated as a fan of some of the stuff, the DC stuff, is that at one point we had four projects coming out. They were all in some way Batman-esque related. And yet there was no proof that any four of them were connected in any way. Right. So it was Birds of Prey, which is almost all Batman side characters. Yeah. Set in Gotham City. And a really fun movie. Yeah, sure. But it hadn't come out in the time. It was 2020. Yeah. Um, This movie, The Suicide Squad... The Batman and Zack Snyder's Justice League, and I'm like, which of these movies connect with which one? Uh, like, I have if if any, if any of them. This could be four movies set in four completely different universes for all we fucking know. We do know the Batman is in a different universe. That one, yes. But the other three, I'm like, what is happening? You know? <laughs> and so it, it was very frustrating not to have any answers up until literally on Thursday when we watched this. It's just a sequel. It is just a sequel. Yeah. And I wish it would have just said that from the beginning. It's it's a sequel, but they just kind of just don't mention the previous movie at all. Like, some of the characters recognize each other. Yeah. And And I get their pickle because they don't want you to remember Suicide Squad. They want to bury it, right? (laughs) Because they want you to go into this movie thinking, oh, this movie might be great. And it is great. We're going to get into it. I really like this movie. And it is very well received. But typically... A sequel to a movie is going to be on a similar quality as the first one, right? Usually slightly worse. It's rare that they're better. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Which is weird. At the most optimistic, the same. It's going to be the same. Yeah. Right? So I understand where they're coming from, but you could have done it so many better ways than causing mass confusion for two years. Only to be be like people that just straight up didn't watch it because of that. Sure. Well, what they don't want is people going like, oh, this is a Suicide Squad sequel. I have to go watch the first one again. And then they watch the first one. They're like, this is horrible. I'm not going to go see this new one. Fun fact. uh, Last week, the first Suicide Squad movie was the number one watched movie on HBO Max. Oh, wow. That's funny. So it didn't work (laughs) is all I'm saying. So a lot more people got exposed to that garbage. Yeah. I don't know. There could have been so many other ways you could do it. You could have done more trailers, more. I don't know. I'm not the expert. I'm just saying you fucked it. And this movie's not making that much money. And COVID obviously has a big part of that. HBO Max has a big part of that. But also, like, I feel like you fucked it. WB, as you usually do. They fucked the marketing up. 
Yeah. So the Suicide Squad is a sequel to Suicide Squad, which uh, brings us to this this next part. So I just thought we could take a few minutes to talk about Suicide Squad 2016 by David Ayer. What are your overall thoughts if you're if you have some ready like lined up? I think it's a movie that had a lot of potential, but it just fell flat on like almost everything it attempted to do. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, let's try to get these anti heroes and make them like become like this family and then have them kind of end up being good guys in the end. Yeah. None of that really worked in the first movie at all. They all spent like one night walking through the city together and that's it. And then they're like, hey, we're family. Yeah. It's like, no. That movie's an enigma to me because, (laughs) so it's a bad movie overall, right? But like we've said, it's almost unfair to just call something bad and just leave it at that. Like, it's not always the sum of its parts. You know what I'm saying? Like, sometimes you right. have to, like, go a little bit deeper. It's bad because of... Of certain elements, whereas yeah. maybe some other elements were, like, good. For Suicide Squad, it's a movie that I like when I'm not watching it, basically. Because I only remember the the highlights. You like it in concept? I love it in concept. Okay. The concept... Here's the thing about the Suicide Squad. The concept... And I'm talking about the 2016 movie. I'm just talking about, like... Whatever. Right. It gets confusing when we're fucking talking about Suicide Squad and the Suicide Squad. <laughs> the concept is great, right? The characters are good, and everything else just kind of got fucked real bad, right? Because the plot, the writing, the yeah, mostly the plot. But it's a movie that's good when you're not watching it because there are really good moments in that film, and there are really good characters in the film, and the premise is really good. And those are the three things that are good about that movie. Basically, everything else in it is bad. Uh, and so Garbage when you're, dialogue. Yeah. And again, in parts. So there are moments in it that are good. For me, it's a good movie if you just watch it in 30 minutes of YouTube clips. Like, that's it. That is how you make this movie good. Otherwise... Watch like a recap of the movie, basically. Yeah. And you're like, oh, okay. Because while kind of doing research for this... <laughs> I like watched a couple clips on YouTube and I was like, oh, I want to watch this movie. I'm like, oh, fuck, it did it. Like, it got me back in because I've seen this movie several times and every time I'm unhappy. Like, it's not a good movie. (laughs) But when you watch just clips of it, you're like, oh, this is really interesting. You know, there are really good moments in this movie and there's good characters. So for me, it's Will Smith's Deadshot, Harley Quinn, Margot Robbie, right? Yeah. Uh, Rick Flagg, Amanda Waller, and that one cop guy, that security guard. From the guy from Mindy Project. The you know what I'm talking guard. about? Oh, oh. That guy. The I like asshole. him. asshole. <laughs> yeah, I like that guy. I thought he was funny. He didn't like uh, Jai Courtney as Captain Boomerang? Yeah, but he didn't have that much to do. But yeah, I do like Jai Courtney a lot. Okay. And I, Yeah, and I like Boomerang. They, see, didn't, you see what they I'm saying? didn't give him a lot to do. He's no, a no, good no, no, character no. and he did like nothing. But do you, do you see what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. if we just sit here and talk about the movie, we're going to be like, oh yeah, that is good. And that is good. And, and like, we're going to be tricked into thinking the and movie's good. I thought good. the effects for Enchantress looked cool. Oh, one of the coolest effects ever is but, the hand thing. Yeah. but That was awesome. She also didn't have that much to do in the movie. Not she's good stuff. Like, uh, she, she just becomes a generic villain at I'm the end. I'm bad. Yeah. Specifically, rewatch the clip uh, when they go after Floyd, uh, who's dead shot. And he does his like little, like, they give him the gun. He starts, like, shooting all the targets. Yeah. Like, dead on. He's impressed that they actually gave him a real gun. He's, like, excited. <laughs> and it's loaded, and he yeah. smells the gunpowder. He's like, oh, like, this is good. And he just starts shooting. He's wonderful in that movie. Like, that's the best part of that film is Will Smith. That's a great clip. You watch his other clip when he's, like, fighting in the streets. That's amazing. You watch some of the stuff with him talking with Margot Robbie. All that stuff is really good. And so... So what uh, are we, some kind of suicide squad? That's the bad part. See what I'm saying? Don't watch that (laughs) clip. You watch... I can assemble 30 minutes of, like, YouTube clips from this movie, and you're going to be like, oh, my God, yeah, I remember that movie. It was pretty good. (laughs) But if you sit down and watch it, it's... So... How about when Rick Flagg introduces Katana? <laughs> this is Katana. She's got my back. <laughs> she can slice you guys up, but I recommend not getting killed by her. Her sword sucks the souls of its... <laughs> it's like the exposition dump that they did with it. It just wasn't good. And what's funny is the Suicide Squad, the new one, James Gunn's, is a proof of concept that that first movie could have worked. Because yeah. everything that first movie set out to do and failed at, the Suicide Squad succeeded in. Yeah. And I want to get to that. But Killer Croc is like a racist stereotype. I don't like Killer Croc. 
I liked his design until he takes his jacket off and he realizes he's really skinny. I'm like, why would they make him bigger? He's supposed to be like a human crocodile. Yeah. He's not very big. They did King Shark way better than they did Killer Croc. Oh, thank God. yeah. Again, it's another proof of concept. Yeah. You could have made Killer Croc cool and you didn't. You fucked yeah. it. And everything the, he the says. The fire dude was okay. Yeah. He El was Diablo. Pre- El Diablo was pretty cool. And he was the only one with like a. Like character a, arc. A character arc. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But the plot is definitely the absolute worst part of this movie. Uh, and a lot of the editing. So Suicide Squad became a problem because. BVS was received kind of like, oh, it's too dark and somber and blah, blah, blah. Right? Right. And so when they're making this movie, which came out the year this after. This was originally going to be a much darker film, right? Yes. David Ayer is, uh, he did um, Training Day. He wrote Training Day and SWAT. Oh, uh, End of Watch. Too. And he directed End of Watch. Okay. Yeah. Those kinds of movies. Yeah. Right? And like really gritty and yeah. yeah, gritty kind of police slash war movies. Yeah. Uh, and so that would have been perfect. For Suicide Squad, right? It, that kind it of movie. Been, if they had let him do it, probably. Um, yeah, from what I understand, there was a shit ton of studio interference, right? Yes. And David Ayer's currently pissed off about this because of the James Gunn Suicide Squad movie. Well, no, <laughs> he he tweeted something that was like he said something recently. So basically, they um because of Guardians of the Galaxy and because of like BVS. <laughs> It's very Which ironic. was James Gunn, yeah. funny enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of those <laughs> things, they're like, when they sent the movie out to a trailer company to cut a trailer, right? that trailer played so well that they're like, oh, let's just make the movie like this. So they rewrote a lot of the movie. Are you talking uh, about the trailer again. that used the Queen song, right? Yes. Yeah. They redid so much that it didn't really become Ayer's movie. At one point, they had two versions of the movie, and they screened them both. And then they made like an amalgamation of both. It's It was a disaster. And I feel bad for the guy. <laughs> seriously, because the end product starts out okay. no, starts out bad because it's it's very meddled and like you said, like a lot of the exposition is like really ham fisted. Yep. It's cut really poorly. And then the middle bit is actually pretty okay. The parts where they're walking down the street and they're all kind of having banter, I like that stuff. I like that stuff a lot. There wasn't nearly enough of it though. And then the plot starts kicking in and then it's bad again. <laughs> and then the ending is horrible. Yeah. So the Amanda Waller stuff was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, it's got its moments. So because of release the Snyder cut, now there's a big push for release the air cut of Suicide Squad. And I'd be interested in seeing that. I would too. But I, what I've set up until now is unless if it's a radically different movie, I don't think it's going to be any better because the worst part of this movie is the plot. Because again, the plot of this film is that Amanda Waller puts together her task force and they're supposed to be doing things that the government cannot be involved in right Right. so they get the people that they could completely deny exist to do it something that you can't call batman for no he wouldn't do it (laughs) exactly and what they're going to use it for is because like their own witch prisoner that they had enchantress got loose and so it is their fault that it happened it's like it's a cover-up sure but sort of. So they send the Suicide Squad. But then like a minute later, the whole city's under siege. And they're like, all right, I guess the Suicide Squad's our last hope. Uh, At that point, it's like, all right, call Batman. Yeah, well, like Wonder Woman should be involved and the Flash should be involved. And my but, point is, but for, uh, it's not a job for the Suicide Squad. No, not at all. So like the plot on a fundamental level is flawed very yeah. much. But from what I also understand, there was a lot of shit that was cut out of this movie. Most of it involving the Joker, though, I think. Okay, yeah, so that's the other thing I want to talk about. So, well, my point about the air cut, before we move on to that, is, like, WB exec said, I forget I forget her name, when she was interviewed about the Snyder cut, she was like, yeah, we did that, but that's it, basically. We're not releasing the air cut. Because I don't think they want people to watch another version of a bad movie and, and have a bad taste in their mouth before watching this one, right? Yeah. Imagine, though, being WB, though, and everybody just wants you to release the original cuts of the movies instead of the shit that you forced them to cobble together. Yeah, it's, it's pretty it's bad. It's a little embarrassing. It should be embarrassing, yeah. So, the Joker. They apparently filmed a shit ton of stuff. And I most of it Jared was Jared Leto out. was pissed off about it. And I would be, too. So, okay, so we're, we're talking about the Joker. What are your thoughts before I... I tell think you mine. in this movie specifically, we just we didn't have enough of him for me to form a real opinion. Mm-hmm. I didn't like the way he looked necessarily. Yeah, like that stupid damage tattoo on his forehead. Uh-huh. But like Leto's acting in the role, from what I saw, was good enough. And I we saw in the Snyder cut that he's actually pretty good at it. Well, he's 
obviously a good actor. Yeah. That's not up for debate here, but okay, so conceptually, like this version of the Joker, I really like. Like I really like it. The problem is is like when you put it on camera, none of it works. Like none of it. And when I saw the tattoos, I'm like, well the tattoos are dumb as shit. Yeah. Like there's no arguing that the no, tattoos they're, are they're dumb. dumb. I don't mind him having tattoos. I think he should be tatted up. But literally saying damaged and like ha 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 a lot. It's not it, clever. It's, it's like not, not anything. It's just dumb. I think the idea was we're going to make a modern day Joker. Right. Like he's kind of like a gangster. He's kind of like, you know, in this more kind of hyper stylized Gotham City that is sort of comic accurate, but sort of kind of like, you know, full fucking pedal to the metal. Yeah. At least it's not neon lights everywhere. I mean, it kind of is. <laughs> not to the point of like Batman Forever. And, Did you see uh, his Batman car? Forever. His Joker mobile is neon lights all over it. So again, he drives a pink Joker mobile. It's a Lamborghini. Like he doesn't wear shirts. He just wears like purple alligator like jackets. His hair is like slick back, like green. Slick it, back or pushed back? Yeah, right. You think this is slick back? <laughs> Um, so he's a piece of shit. I think it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's a great idea and I think it's a great look again, other than the, the specifics of the tattoos. Yeah. I th- although I do like the tear tattoo. That's a J. I thought, I thought that one was cool. The rest of them. Is that like dumb. the only good one? <laughs> no, I like the smile on the hand. I thought that was cool. He well, he actually it, like uses that. Yeah. On, where he puts like, it on, I'm yeah. covering my mouth, where he puts it on his face. I thought that was cool. The rest of the tattoos suck. But I mean, the concept of he's like. Not only is he like this criminal genius, he's also kind of like a crime lord and a gangster. Yeah. I think all that's great. And there are moments in this movie where he shines. But there are so few because most of it is so chopped up. It's almost out of context. Yes, that's exactly what it is. You get the feeling that they did a whole scene and they only showed you 30 seconds in the middle of like a three minute scene. Like every time he talks... It's like he was already talking and you missed out on it. Yeah. And it's weird, too, because you absolutely notice it. Oh, yeah. If it's pointed out to you, you're going to notice it. It is so misedited. It's just Mm -hmm. chopped up. And I'm like, there's a movie here somewhere. That just wasn't made. And the Joker would be good in it, and it would have inspired them to make more because they wanted to make I more Joker movies. I wanted to see this didn't. Joker interact with Batman, which thank God we got a taste of that. Yeah, in Snyder's Justice League, but we're probably never. But that was it. like an alternate universe, future thing. Yeah, and all they could do is like allude to their past, and so, I'm yeah. finally gonna kill you, and all this. I mean, sure, but like it was a lot of telling and no showing. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, at least what I like there is that they let him act. Like, Jared Leto, like, yeah. gets to hold the camera. He got to monologue. A, yeah, he got to monologue. And I'm like, this is what you should have always done. In this, in Suicide Squad, he gets clips, basically. It's just, like, clips. And that's it. Yep. And, again, they're out of context. You could probably play them in any order and then make just as much sense. His subplot is literally just saving Harley. And he fails at it. And then we don't see him again. Doesn't he break her out at the end? Yeah, in a post credits, he breaks her up, or it's like at the very end. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a tag at the end, and then that's it. So, did he need to be in the movie? I mean, plot wise, no, he didn't need to be in the movie. No, not he, at all. And there was probably something else there. So, he for those been reasons, in a Batman movie. Yeah, for those reasons, I would I would have liked to maybe see an air cut. And I mean, I still think they should make more stuff with the Joker in it, even if Ben Affleck, whatever, like. Do another Joker thing with Harley Quinn. Make a Harley Quinn sequel and the Joker's in it. Maybe she kills him. I don't know. And it's a different timeline. Oh, Maybe he kills her. <laughs> well, in it's alluded Snyder to- Cut, he- someone does kill Harley. Uh, Harley dies. Uh, it's probably Superman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they just have Superman, Superman kill everyone. Yeah. <laughs> so, other highlights of that movie is that there's a Flash cameo and the Batman scenes in that movie are fantastic. All, like, two of them? There's... Three of them. Oh, there's three. Well, there's two Batman scenes and one Bruce Wayne scene. Okay. Oh, here's something. Did you know? You remember when Enchantress starts just like belly dancing? And yeah. Then her, her character no longer is interesting. Apparently, originally, this movie was going to introduce Steppenwolf. Really? Yeah. It was going to be like Steppenwolf's first attempt at coming into Earth. That would have f- been cool. It would have been cool. Then they <laughs> fail, and then that sets up Justice League. <laughs> that would have, I think, made the movie better in retrospect. She might yeah. not have made the plot better, but... No, 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 no. And I always said that the Suicide Squad should not be doing shit like this. Like they world-ending 
Obvi- shit. Well, that's obvious. I'm saying they should be going abroad. They should be toppling governments. They should be doing some CIA like. So like what they do be- in this new movie. Yes. <laughs> and I like wish dark ops. Yes, shit. Yeah. exactly. And I really wish we had recorded this so I could have said that. So it's obvious I'm not lying, but because that's what they do in the Suicide Squad. Yeah. I said they. Sh- you know what they should have done? They should have been going after the Joker, and Batman could have also been going after the Joker. And the three of it's like a three way thing, because that's what they did in the Suicide Squad Arkham movie. I don't know if you've seen that. I haven't. It's animated. It's one of the animated ones. It's actually really good. It's better than this one. <laughs> and well, then a lot of movies are better. Than yeah, this sure, one. sure. I'm saying out of Suicide Squad oh, movies, yeah. it ranks second behind the new one. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> or I thought you know what'd be cool is that they should be going after the League of Shadows. Because they're an international terrorist organization yeah. and Ra's al Ghul. Batman's getting involved. And they could bring back Liam Neeson. And they could do all kinds of stuff. Well, no, but they could they do all could. kinds of stuff, you know? Or do something with the Joker. There's so many other plot things they could have set up instead of what they did, is right. what I'm saying. So, again, bad movie, but... Poor decisions made all around it's this got, oh, 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 I forgot about my other favorite thing about this movie. Like, a th- thing I actually do like about this movie is that it's a universe builder. Because remember, when you look at the DCEU in the way that it, w- it was released, it's like Man of Steel, which is like a Superman movie, but it's kind of set in our world. It's yeah. not a heightened comic book world, right? It's, it, it's, it's Kansas. It's supposed to be kind of like... you see like Metropolis. For yeah. Like, you see Metropolis get destroyed. And exactly. That's it. <laughs> it, it's supposed to be kind of like, this is our world. And now Superman's the only weird thing in it. Yeah. And then Batman versus Superman, which is like, same exact thing. The only difference is like, oh, Batman's been here this whole time. That's it. It's still kind of set in our world. And then this is like, actually, there's crazy witches and there's a bitch who like puts souls and swords (laughs) and there's a crocodile man and hey, there's the Flash and there's, you know what I'm saying? Like this really was the movie that kind of set the tone for the universe as far as like. It makes it feel comic, like a comic book. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of starts setting this world apart from other things. Again, in premise, great idea. Did they execute it? Not very well. No. So, but yeah, I, mean, I remember watching it being like, one of my favorite things is like, there's so many like minor Batman people in it, like Killer Croc and like Harley Quinn. Yeah. And things uh, that we hadn't seen. Captain on, Boomerang. Even though he's before. like a minor Flash villain, like all the all these other things. And so. they made him like fun. Yeah. Yeah. So again, good in YouTube clips, but bad as a movie as a whole. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's move on. Can I put the first movie in the Phantom Zone? I mean, no. It's <laughs> not. It's still part of this series. I wish it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the thing. I still don't hate it. As bad as it is, I don't hate it. But also, like, this movie builds off of it in a sort of way. But let's get into the characters. Okay. All right, so characters. These are the new characters in the Suicide okay. Squad. We are talking about the new one that came yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, we're moving on now. Yeah. Okay, so in this movie, you should not watch the trailers too much i think no it's if you do you're gonna start figuring out what the team trickles down to also don't look at this poster too much either because that is everyone that survives (laughs) this is a movie that i feel like could have done better with like more ambiguous trailers because some people started figuring out who was likely to die and survive yeah because it's a suicide squad movie you know a lot of them are gonna die (laughs) okay that here's the other thing in the last movie only two of them died uh, so two out of like the six though so. sure in this one two-thirds of the people we're gonna talk about die so it's a lot there's so a, there's a huge body count in this movie yeah, yeah. so what i did is because if you go on wikipedia and you just list all the names which is what i did they go in order of importance so then i randomized it so okay. i'm gonna read these all in random order i said not give away like who lives and dies yeah Okay, so we got Rick Flagg, played by Joe Kinnaman. So he is the leader. He is the only one who's not a like an criminal. Inmate. Or, yeah. yeah, he's he's Amanda Waller's man. Right, right. right. He's yeah. a military man. Uh, he leads the group. I always wonder why does he fucking do it? Is he be like he's? Is a, it talked about in the first movie? Is he being blackmailed or something? In the first one, he was blackmailed. In this one, is this just his job? In the first one, uh, she's got remember he's dating Enchantress. Oh yeah, and she's like gonna kill her. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, Waller has something on everyone to make them do whatever she wants them to do. So Pretty much, yeah. They don't really have a choice but to work for her, so I'm sure there's something. 
Rick yeah. Flag is also one of the returning characters. Yeah. yeah. So again, how do you know this is a sequel? Uh, it's got four returning cast members in the same roles. That should be a dead giveaway. Yeah. But again, we weren't sure if it was still a reboot, like a well, do-over. We had people asking during the movie, is this a sequel? I'm confused. Exactly. Not to go back to this, but like, it's a sequel. Just don't think about it too much. That's all you got to do. What's nice about this is like, they're episodic, basically. The Suicide Squad went on another adventure. Like, it's like James Bond movies. Do you need to have seen them all? No. You can just jump no. in this one if you want. That's the, the what plots they did. aren't directly related it's in any way. N- almost in any way at all, yeah. So I like Rick Flag a lot. I, I like his accent. I like his character. Next I got Weasel, <laughs> played by Sean Gunn. He's a He's that, an ugly little thing. He's the guy who looks like Like a werewolf. No, he looks like a <laughs> bad taxidermy. A very bad taxidermy. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> like horrifying to look at. So there are no original characters here, basically. These are all like deep cut comic book characters. Yeah. But the Weasel is one of two that are kind of original because in Suicide Squad comics, there is a character named Weasel. However, he is like like a full man. Ba- like think of like Cheetah or something. Okay. You know, from Wonder Woman. Like a like person that. that became like an animal hybrid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's very competent. He's not this. This is more based on Bill the Cat, the comic strip. <laughs> Have you ever seen Bill the Cat? No. All right, I'm going to link what it below. Is that? It's, a, it's a comic, and uh, that's it? what he looks like. <laughs> oh, all right. So basically exactly that. Weasel looks horrifying. Like, his eyes are just gross to look at. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty fun, though. Yeah. Uh-huh. And this is like a CG character that Sean Gunn, like, does the motion capture for right, right, right. Like, Sean, he, like he did with Rocket. Yeah, Sean Gunn is uh, James Gunn's brother, actor, uh, and he's, he also did Rocket Raccoon's yeah. motion capture. Yeah, He's also in, like, every movie James Gunn makes. Yeah, but he also <laughs> does, like, he was... Uh, in this movie, he played uh, yeah, yeah, a yeah. cameo appearance as a character that I don't know if you want to talk about yet. Yeah, I have it written down. Okay. And he's then, Calendar Man. Yeah. He's a minor Batman villain. Minor Batman villain, but if you played the Arkham games, you're very familiar with him. I was talking about... Crag Craglin Craglin from you. Guardians. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. has like a speaking role too. One of the Ravagers. Nanue or King Shark, voiced by Sylvester Stallone, who was also in Guardians. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like this iteration of King Shark a lot. However, it is a both a departure from the Harley Quinn show one, mm. but that in and it of itself is also kind of like an original version, version of that of character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. King Shark. King Shark's just kind of somewhere in the middle like he's not super smart but he's not super dumb either in this movie he's like super dumb he's like yeah he's but super it's dumb. like almost like adorable how dumb he is yeah <laughs> <laughs> he's basically a talking animal is what he yeah is. cleo Cazo or rat catcher 2 played by daniela melquar melquar so is rat catcher 2 an original character because i know nope. rat catcher is rat- a comic character i don't so know about rat catcher 2 rat catcher is a Batman villain who right. lives in the sewers of Gotham City and has learned to communicate with rats and uses rats to steal things and fight for him and stuff like that. Basically like petty crimes. Yeah. And then Ratcatcher 2 or Ratcatcher's daughter also becomes a character later on. Okay. Right. So there are multiple Ratcatchers. Also, like, it's a very DC thing to, like, start numbering different versions of like the same character because it happens anytime and it happens in marvel too where you find a character and you're like oh there's these four different versions of that character because different people keep on like picking i don't up think the in mantle. marvel they really number them though it's like captain america no, was this person this person and this person yeah well that's what i'm saying it's yeah. like you look up taskmaster there's three of them yeah. you know you look up this other character there's because two like of the them. superhero names are more like titles or mantles yeah exactly yeah. So I just thought it's funny that they like, you know, skip Rat Catcher and go to Rat Catcher 2. It made me think of like um, Ant-Man. They were like, oh, we're going to start with the second version. Yeah. Or like even Captain Marvel starting with Carol Danvers instead of like Marvel. Yeah. They even kind of make a joke about it. It's like, what, you couldn't afford Rat Catcher 1? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she's played by a Portuguese actress. So they made the character Portuguese, which is something I really appreciate because, you know, there was a time when in movies in America, like... All characters had to be one of three nationalities. It was like... White? Yeah. No, it was like American, like Mexican, or like British. You know and what I mean? Was, yeah, that was pretty much it. It's like, okay, if you're ethnic, you're Mexican. Like, if you're if you're a bad guy, you're British. Like, oh, you're Australian? Learn a British accent. 
You know what I mean? And now it's like... They kept it too simple. Like, Ratcatcher is from Gotham City. Like, it's not a Portuguese character, but because they hired a Portuguese actress, they're like, well, fuck, make her Portuguese. Why not? Also, you know, like, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting that, like, you know, she was, like, in the streets of, like, somewhere in Portugal, and she's like, oh, American Dream, we came to America, and now I'm in jail. <laughs> like, also, her little rat, Sebastian. Sebastian. Cutest little thing. And it's, it's voiced by D. Bradley Baker. Who also does the voice of Appa in Avatar, Momo a lot, a lot in of Avatar. An, yeah, a lot of animals. A lot of animals. He plays every clone in the Clone Wars. Yep. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Oh, and fun fact about her. She is the, because she doesn't have a lot of acting credits, but she is the Portuguese voice of Spider-Gwen in Into the Spider-Verse. Okay. Next, I have Robert Dubois, or Bloodsport, played by Idris Elba. So, basically a stand-in for Will Smith. Because they wanted to get Will Smith yep. for this. James Gunn wanted to bring also back Will Smith, Deadshot, and scheduling or whatever. So he was Will replaced Smith by. Do it. Yeah. Uh, he was replaced by Bloodsport, who is a similar ish character. Yeah. I'm glad they also made him a new character and didn't just recast Will Smith. Uh, yeah, me too. Because it's like, Cause who knows also, what happens in the This also future, gives yeah. Will Smith the opportunity to come back who, as Deadshot still. Yeah. And like I said, one of my favorite parts of that movie is Deadshot. And also, we talked about this in. The what would have been Justice League 2 and 3, Deadshot would have been on the team because he would have had the kryptonite bullet and he would have to have shot Superman, which is maybe what informed that one thing about uh, Bloodsport, Bloodsport cause having that's, shot. Yeah. Because the reason why he's in jail is because he put Superman in the ICU. <laughs> exactly. With a kryptonite bullet. However, it goes both ways because he did that in the comics, too. Okay. So it's just kind of like, yes, he is a stand in for this other character, but he's also entirely based on his character, too. Yeah. So it it works out. It does work out. And I liked him a lot in this movie. Actually, um, yeah. Idris Elba nailed it. Idris Elba is, is great and uh, he's very popular and he hasn't been in a DC movie. So he really could have mm. taken his pick. He was in a Marvel movie. To do. He's been in two Marvel movies, really. Yeah. Well, what's the second one? Because I know he was in Ghost Rider, Spirit of Vengeance. I thought that was what you were asking me about. You said two Marvel movies. Yeah, like... he's Heimdall. Oh, fuck. You idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. I thought you were like, I, I thought you couldn't think of Ghost Rider. No, I had a stupid brain fart. I was oh, trying yeah. to make a Ghost Rider joke. No, I was I was going to make the Ghost Rider joke on you. <laughs> Bozo. Amanda Waller, played by Viola Davis. She was great in the first one. That's a standout in the first movie. And also in this one. Viola Davis is just like nails it. Like she's yeah. she is the character like ripped out of the comics really. Digger Harkness, aka Captain Boomerang, played by Jai Courtney. Uh, Another one of the returning characters, along with Amanda Waller. Yeah. And Rick Flag. I liked him in the first one. I just wish he did more with the boomerangs because he just kind of like threw it a couple times and, like, and then he had some people in the head. Yeah, and he had the camera one, the boomerang where he throws it and it has a camera on it. It's like a drone. Yeah. The physics of which makes no sense. No, not but. At all. Boomerangs, Boomerangs do barely not work. always come back to you. <laughs> they barely work. Dick Hurts, a.k.a. Blackguard, played by <laughs> Pete Davidson, is a deep cut. He is like a member of like a gang. I think they're called the Thousand or something uh, in the comics. And he's like a they're like a Robin villain. He's like I, a I super know, minor remember. villain, though, right? It's incredibly minor. So I think it's just one of those things where like, hey, we have Pete Davidson. Let's just. Pick a we'll random. Just throw him in a roll. Let's just pick a random roll and not think too hard about it. But Sable's obsessed with Pete Davidson. I think he's funny. I think he's all right. He's <laughs> all right. <laughs> he was funny in this. Corey Pitzner, aka TDK, played by Nathan Fillion. So this is a semi-original character. It's like an original character, loosely based on an existing character. Yeah, I don't want to say it because it's a spoiler. Who he so, is, sort of. Well, it, it is a spoiler because of the gag. Because right. TDK is an original name, right? There yes. is no comic character named TDK in the and, comics. And they're asking him, like, what does TDK, uh, what does TDK stand for? And he just goes, it's my name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> People figured it out. There's a poster where you can pretty much figure out who he is. And so, like, I, I already knew going in. So there's no character named TDK. He's actually a different character. Uh, and if I tell you, then it ruins the gag. So yeah. we'll talk about it in spoilers. But so semi-original because... That's not a name. Hmm. Abner Krill, a.k.a. the Polka Dot Man, played by David... D- D- I don't know how to say his last name. Uh, he's the guy from... He's an Ant-Man. Ant-Man. Yeah. yeah. He's the Russian guy in Ant-Man. The one that's afraid of Baba Yaga. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so 
super interesting fun fact about this guy. He has been in four completely unrelated DC things. He's been in three unrelated Batman things. So he was in The Dark Knight. He was the guy that... He was that, one of the cops, right? No, he was one, no. of, the jo- one, of, the one of the Joker the jo- thugs. Oh. That the Joker, like, corrupted because he's a schizophrenic. Yeah. And he, like, is easily, like... He, like, won't tell a secret or whatever uh, like yeah. that. He was also in Gotham. He was uh, He's in this movie. And he was in The Flash. Like, the TV show. <laughs> the CW All, show. Yeah. So, three Batman things, four DC things, none of which are related with one another. That's... Like, four different universes. That's kind of awesome. I think that makes him, like, the deepest rooted dc actor <laughs> also i loved polka dot man in this movie okay so polka dot man is is a character by bill finger batman bill finger creative. Yeah. yeah if you want to know more about bill finger and bob kane we did a keeper cancel on them on the our batman episode of the 1989 batman super interesting basically bill finger is the guy who who really uh invented batman and wasn't it, credited for it until he, recently yes and so for a good like 15 20 years he just worked on the comics and he came up with a bunch of different characters. And in the 50s, Batman was very gimmicky and very lighthearted and campy. All his like villains were like one-offs that had like crazy gimmicks. That was like the <laughs> bit. And so Polka Dot Man is literally a guy who throws polka dots at people. And that's that's his power. That's a superpower. And it's such a ridiculous concept. But this movie takes it in an interesting direction though. Yeah, and it's just James Gunn said like he like wanted to use like the worst character yep like who is like the worst villain like and he, he ended up him. making him like honestly like very interesting very yeah. interesting yeah. not to say kind of much, awesome yeah. yeah like like we were gonna say like calendar man is in this and they have a short conversation uh and that's funny because they're both characters that were written by bill finger around the same time as one-off like gimmick villains yeah uh, although calendar man was then kind of like used by other writers and kind of brought to more modern day and yeah. Made into more like an OCD obsessive, you know, makes all his crimes like date references and stuff. It's always like on a, like a holiday or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mongal, played by Mayan, Myling. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's, an, uh, it's hard to pronounce. I don't know how pronounce. you pronounce that. Um, it's I think just that's, NG. I think that's that might be Thai. I don't know. Anyway, kind of a minor character, but also she has. So she's like the daughter of Mongol. And so she's Mongal. And like, like an alien villain. Yeah, yeah. Like a very powerful one. Like a Superman level villain. <laughs> and yet she just does. Like she's on the Suicide Squad. Like that doesn't. She got imprisoned and put on the. Yeah. Yeah. I, I... And they even asked her, like, <laughs> is she like an alien or a god? Like, what is she? <laughs> right. And so she should be more powerful than they make her out in this, but whatever. Christopher Smith, aka Peacemaker, played by John Cena. So <laughs> he kind of did a really good job. John Cena's. John Cena's a better actor, I than think, he than he should be. Yeah. yeah, I can't tell if he's a good actor or they just give him really good roles where he can shine in. I think that's basically that might where he be can it. kind of play himself. Uh, yeah, I think it's kind of like with The Rock. Like The Rock is like a I popular don't think the actor. The Rock's a good actor, though. Well, that's what I'm saying. They put him in roles where he can succeed because they're simple. They're for him. You know, like, he doesn't just, have to just be act. Tough. Yeah, he doesn't have to act too hard. You know. Yeah. If you put him in a dramatic role, like, what's he going to do? I'm not sure. You know? <laughs> we should rewatch The Scorpion King and just see how he, how he is in it. <laughs> he showed up in the red carpet in his Peacemaker outfit, which I thought was really funny. Yeah. John Cena was, like, really into this character. John Cena was really funny. Except for when he's uh, apologizing to China. <laughs> I think he was kind of like... I think he I, had to do it. No. Absolutely he had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> like, 100%. That was not his... That was like a, yeah. hey, if you want to keep your job... You... Yeah, you have to apologize to China. Brian oh. Durlin slash Savant, played by Michael Rooker. Michael Rooker is like his uh, good luck charm, James Gunn. He puts him in every movie. Yeah. It's, I think it's just another one of like James Gunn's friends, too, that just... Yeah. So Savant is like this... Uh, I don't know much about him, but he's on the Suicide Squad usually, too. Uh, Harley Quinn... Harleen Quinzel. Harleen Qu- Dr. Harleen Quinzel. Yeah, 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 Played by Margot Robbie. This is her third time playing this character now. Yeah. Yeah, Suicide Squad, uh, Birds of Prey, and this. Fantastic. Yeah. I always think it's funny, like, most of these characters are, like, Batman characters. And, I mean, it's just, like, he has Batman has the most interesting year, characters. 70 some years of, like, you know, lore and mythology and obviously, but. And then Gunter Braun, a.k.a. Javelin, played by Flula Borg. Also, just known as Flula, because he's like his internet personality. Is the German guy? Yeah, Javelin's a um another minor villain, right? 
Is uh, he I've... a Green Lantern villain? I forgot to look him up, actually. I think he's a Wait, Green Lantern I villain. I thought he was like a minor Flash villain. I remember the, the guy that Pete Davidson played. Was it Black... Um... Blackguard. Blackguard. He's a Booster Gold villain. Yes. <laughs> so also, sorry. why sorry, have we not I... gotten Booster Gold yet? We are. It's that's when? coming. I don't know, but it, it, they've been casting for. He's such a fun character because they're doing Blue Beetle. They just announced the casting Blue for Beetle's Blue Beetle. Blue cool too. He's gonna be this uh, uh, like a Hispanic guy. Oh, good. Yeah, we're getting a superhero. Yay! I don't think he's a um. Who javelin? Yeah, I don't. Oh. Yeah. Then who he the seems, hell is he? Uh, he just got put into a Suicide Squad, I think. Oh no, no, no. fought Green Lantern, but and was defeated before agreeing to start the Suicide oh, Squad. Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay, so that wraps the characters. Let's just get into our official review, I guess. Dude, I just wanted to like go over the characters because I've like there's just so many of them. Wait, did we talk about Ratcatcher? Oh, we did talk about Ratcatcher. Yeah. Why do I feel like we skipped somebody? I don't know. I guess we did. We talked about Blackguard. King Shark. Captain Boomerang. King Shark. King Shark. Weasel. I didn't put the Thinker. That's why I didn't put. Oh, he's. Yeah, whatever. In this movie, (laughs) (laughs) he is in this movie. Played by uh, what's his name? Peter Capaldi? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who was Doctor, uh, Who. Doctor Who. We're going to uh, try our best to review this movie without spoiling it, and then we're going to get into the spoilers. Overall thoughts, Birdo? Uh, this movie was it was a lot of fun. Like I already thought it was going to be fun going into it. Yeah. But <laughs> it was more fun than I thought it would be. Like As I was watching, one, I was interested the whole time. And two, I just was legitimately laughing out loud at a lot of what was going on in here. It's fun. There's a lot yeah. of like very dark humor, but like that's yeah. also my kind of humor, so it kind of it, it tickles me. <laughs> it tickles me. <laughs> it's also like well written humor. It's James Gunn's a really good writer. Yeah, he does really good at balancing the humor and also like emotional parts of like yeah of almost everything he does actually. Yeah, I would say he might be a better writer than director, and I'm not saying he's a bad writer or a bad director. I'm just saying that speaks to like that he's a great he's writer, a fantastic writer, and I, I feel like it's easy. You know, being a director is a lot easier when when the script is like just top notch. You know, I'm sure he was the reason why I love Scooby Doo movie so much. <laughs> yeah, he wrote that movie, and that but, movie's really funny. <laughs> um, we we've talked about that. I think have we talked about it? We might have mentioned he, it. He wrote Scooby Doo and the the first movie. I think he wrote the second one too. That's why that, but he was really, he was definitely was involved in them. Really yeah. funny, um, and I didn't realize it until we watched it like recently. But, but yeah, overall this movie is fantastic. I think my expectations were I don't know, like I wasn't thinking too, I wasn't that excited about this movie. I think the reason is is because I knew it was gonna be good, because it's like okay, here's James Gunn, like he has this track record of success, making great movies that specifically inspired this concept before he got involved, right? Yeah. So, like... This movie was, like, perfect for him. Oh, yeah. Obviously, he would... When we said this earlier, he's, like, the missing piece that the Suicide Squad needed is James Gunn, right? Why try to make a James Gunn-style movie when you can just get James Gunn to make the movie, right? That was the best decision WV's made in a long time. Seriously. So, like, I haven't been... Overly excited because I think I knew exactly what I was going to get. So I guess I wasn't surprised. Okay. However, it's fantastic. He does a good job subverting expectations while also not like upsetting you, you know? Yeah. Because. Oh, well, I'm sure he upset some people. Probably. <laughs> he probably but upset a lot of people. There, there is a balance of like, you know, when you watch a movie, you want to see what your brain wants to see. Yes. You know what I mean? Like if you set up a joke you want to hear the punchline right if you Mm -hmm. set up a plot a certain way you want to see the resolution but like sometimes when it's too obvious and you know a filmmaker will quote unquote subvert your expectations by doing the opposite or a lot of times it doesn't make sense yeah not giving you that thing that you're expecting and that in turn is a surprise which is then entertaining right yeah if it's done right (laughs) yeah because you can subvert expectations by just being like making a stupid twist like a lot of the m night Shyamalan movies yeah or exactly like, all right yeah that was a twist i didn't see that coming but like huh sure it so it makes sense i think part of what i was kind of nervous about this movie is like unlike the last movie where they're like oh we're gonna show we're gonna we can kill one suicide squad member to prove that like you can do it right it's right. almost like chekhov's head bomb <laughs> Chekhov's. yeah yeah <laughs> you know what because I mean? they put bombs what, in people's what, heads it has to explode at some at, point at least one has to yeah so you know, when a good director gets involved in this property, I'm like, 
well, he's going to kill half the characters. <laughs> and everybody knew that going in because when they introduced, like the first trailer wasn't a trailer. It was like a, like almost like a sizzle reel where they introduced all the Suicide Squad members. And then they're yeah. like, they put 14, 15 people on it's screen. Like there's no way they're all going to make it through the whole movie. I'm like, these guys are just going to be dying left and right. Like you cannot get attached to any of them. And then they said as much, or like, we're basically going to be killing all these people. So <laughs> don't get attached. But, like, the movie wants you to be attached for dramatic effect. Yes. So the whole time I'm like, God damn it, like... Like, shit, I'm starting like, to like this person. Are um, they going to kill Harley Quinn? Like, what the fuck? Like, I honestly didn't know. Like, nobody has plot armor. And according no one, to WB, they could have killed Harley Quinn. Uh, exactly. <laughs> nobody has plot armor. Nobody has famous person armor either. Like, <laughs> like nope. you can kill Idris Elba. That's on the table. You can kill... Uh, Pete Davidson or Micah Rooker or or Viola Davis, like who it, it, fucking it's knows? All up in the air. So I'm like, which was kind of exciting while you're it, watching the movie. It is because you're it, you're, it's you're, it's you're a little on the edge of your seat. Yes, and it's nerve wracking because unlike most movies, like say you watch Guardians of the Galaxy, and they're gonna go fight, you know, some battle. You're not really worried that any of them are gonna die. Odds are your favorite character is gonna live. Yeah. Or if they die, they're going to undo it a scene later or something. That seems to be Marvel's thing. Yeah, here, they, I'm like... They undid Gamora, sort of. Yeah. Here, when they storm the beach, that's in a trailer. It's an, I'm not spoiling it. When they storm the beach, I'm like, God damn it. Like, uh, who's going to survive this? I'm afraid that, like, every literal person is going to die. <laughs> or in some other action scenes, too. A lot of the action scenes are very, like, you do think your protagonists are going to get killed. Yeah. But that's also good. Like, storytelling-wise, it adds a little bit of stakes. It, realism what, yes again like a little bit of heart like yeah nobody feels safe in this movie at all not even the innocent bystanders <laughs> <laughs> oh they're absolutely cannon fodder like <laughs> they're all gonna die so what i was saying earlier is because i'm trying to think of things that we can say without spoiling anything because it's like it's if, hard if you talk too much about this movie you're gonna reveal who's in it more than others and therefore reveal who dies you know right. what i mean but I think my favorite thing about this movie is that it is a, like, after the fact proof of concept of Suicide Squad. Like we said earlier when we were talking about that first movie, this movie proves that that movie could have been better if it was done right. Yes. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Things that that movie tried to do and failed at, inserting James Gunny type music. <laughs> that movie did it very poorly. And this movie did great. Why? Because it's James Gunn and he put music in it. <laughs> Which he does in a lot of his movies. So, I don't know if you liked it or not, but some people... I read some things that they were, like, let down by the music, the song choices. And I think what happened is that they were expecting Guardians of the Galaxy. And they're expecting very specifically, like, 70s to 80s music. I wasn't expecting that. So, it's... James Gunn put that music in those movies because that's what those movies are about. Yeah, those the music used in those movies are very much, in a way, important to the plot. Yeah, no, absolutely. Also, they, like, that's they helped tell the literally story. Peter's music that he got from his mom. From the 70s from, and the 80s. Yes. Yeah, exactly. In that sense, that makes sense. I did notice in this movie, almost all, if not all, the scenes where they are playing music, like, we'll hear the music, like, in normal quality, and then it'll change, and you'll realize that the character in the scene is actually listening to this music, too. Oh, yeah, that happens. There's a word for it. It happens, I think, almost every time. Every time? Really? I think so. Fuck, I've watched this movie twice. Now you're going to make me watch it again? Uh, so what that's called is called diegetic and non-diegetic music. Yes. So diegetic music means it's music in the story. So basically it's music that the characters can the char hear. Whereas non-diegetic is like a soundtrack where they cannot hear. I want to uh, say the only time it's non-diegetic is... The end. Maybe the end, but there's a scene I'm thinking about. I can't really. I, it's a spoiler. Okay, well, then save it for spoilers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to have to go. Fuck, I don't want to go back. But uh, I, I, again, two days, I've seen it twice. I can, I'm trying to think. You might be right, actually. Oh, shit, you might be right. Because I think the songs all start off like non diegetic, like we're just yeah. hearing as part of sound. But and then it, it'll like kind of fade it into, transitions into it. Transitions it's into, in the scene, yeah. yeah. James Gunn's real smart. I mean, he did that in Guardians a couple times. I like, think um, hooked on a feeling is when the prison guard. I think all of it's diegetic because he's. It's all his all, tape. Well, some of it is. It's on the tape, and we're hearing it, but they're not listening to it. I don't think. You might be right. <laughs> oh my God, we're about to watch Guardians on our rewatch of Marvel. 
So I might because I'm even to, at I'm the end when they're listening that. to "I Want You Back," Groot's listening to it and dancing. Yeah, you're right. Because I was thinking about um, "Hooked on a Feeling." The guard is the listening guard to is it. listening to it in the headphones, and then it plays like non diegetically like it plays loud yeah. and, and, and good. P- Peter yells at him about it. He's like, yeah, yeah, "Hooked yeah. on a Feeling," Blue Sweet. That sweet. song is mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, then there's the time. Then he and Gamora are listening to the thing. Uh, Cherry Bomb. They're just walking out to. Like in their new outfits for the fight, do they play it over the ship speakers? They probably do. That's a thing because he has the he has, he the, has music the tape on. deck. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh wow, I'm gonna look out for that now. It happens in Guardians too. Also, it happens a, a lot. Where Rocket's yep. like, "Hey, do you have any of Quill's old music?" You I, might be on to something. I here. think I am. Oh, that's <laughs> super smart. So yeah, James Gunn uses music to like help tell the story. Uh, and I love it. And, and sometimes it informs characters, their motivations, it's like, like their it's inner really thoughts. It's good use of licensed music. Yeah, exactly. I especially like the song at the end. It's not a song. It's it's actual like score music. It ends up becoming like the theme for uh, the gar- I said the Guardians for the Suicide Squad. I think it's really good. Okay. And then I guess the only thing we can talk about spoilers. Oh, oh I was saying I was listing reasons why this movie does. Suicide Squad better than the first Suicide Squad. Okay. The things that that first Suicide Squad tried to do, and when I said music, friendship themes. Oh, like the whole like family bonding type. No, deal? no, no, friendship bonding. <laughs> because that first movie, <laughs> they call themselves a family after like six hours, and <laughs> yeah, you compare it to Guardians of the Galaxy, which is what that movie is sort of based on. Like it's an answer to that. And in Guardians, at no point are they like, oh, we're family. They're like, all right, maybe we can be friends. Maybe we can be a team. And by the end of the movie, they're like, all right, fine. We're friends. And Groot sacrificed himself, and I guess we're all friends now. Like, it's a very realistic jump, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's not like, oh, I guess we're a family now the because I said so. The second movie, I think, is more of a family movie. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Well, it's all about families. It's about sisters, and it's about father-sons. And... Yeah. Well, I think it's about them, too. And, and they're becoming yeah. more of a family, exactly. But And that makes sense. They've spent more time together. Yeah. And you have Groot. Oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Because then you got Groot and Rocket. And Rocket's kind of his parent now. It's like Rocket and Peter are like his parents. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. like co-dads. <laughs> yeah, so the friendship themes. Because yeah. here, without spoiling, friendship is like the major theme here almost. Between, yeah, especially between like multiple characters. like especially Multiple different characters. Dif- yes. They all are learning like teamwork through friendship. And it's not shoved down your throat. You know what I mean? It's very subtle. Yeah. It's very well done, I think. And then the team learns to be heroes, not just hired guns. That's also kind of like what the last movie tried to do is like, all right, we're 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 not just the bad guys. We can be superheroes. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's very Power Rangers-y at the last, at the end of the third act of Suicide Squad. Whereas yeah. in this, it's fantastic. Like, it, you had good ideas for that first movie. It just, it took James Gunn to like realize them. Yeah. Without giving up on it. You know, like he went and he made a Suicide Squad movie that is such a DC comic book movie. It doesn't make any concessions. You so know what I mean? I guess thematically, this is like a reboot. <laughs> yeah. Thematically, redo the first movie. Yeah. No, seriously, because it, this is exactly what what the first movie tried to do and failed yeah. spectacularly at. Right? Because the first movie tried to be uh, James Gunn. Yeah. I, I don't think it's a spoiler to say by the end of this, they learn to be heroes. Like that's kind of the point, you know. That should yeah. be, in, that should be obvious. Like, I mean, they're not like Justice League, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but they're fuck, like, yeah, they're not like do gooders. Yeah, <laughs> but they're not pure evil. They learn to like be a team and 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 be the hero. And give a shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I guess that's really all I have. No spoilers. All around, this movie is is very good. It, the action is amazing. Uh, there's yeah. some there's some really there's some action bits that are really there's very some, like, well done. Beautiful action pieces. Oh, yeah. uh, I didn't talk about pieces. like cinematography or anything like that. It's but it's it's good. There's there's not much worth yeah. saying. Other oh, than there good. are um, and this isn't a spoiler. The movie in a way is sort of like broken up into chapters. Oh yeah, I was gonna say that in spoilers. Yeah, it's chaptered. This movie's absolutely yeah. chaptered. But um, the way it's done just looks really cool. It's okay. So what I was gonna say also is the last movie is very infamous for having too much shit on the screen, like titles and stats and all this stuff. And people hated it. (laughs) This movie did the same thing, but somehow it's way better. And it's hard for me to draw the line and be like, why is this good? And why was that bad? You know what I mean? Yeah. I kind of cannot tell. 
It's just, it is a very subtle thing. Something about it's just done better. It's just better. Because this has, I mean, it's not exactly like Zack Snyder's Justice League. That was a chapter movie, and it cuts to like like a title card. It has titles, and this is chaptered. Sometimes it's just like eight minutes earlier, three days yeah. earlier. And then sometimes it's like straight up like the Suicide Squad do this. And, yeah. And, and it, that's a chapter. And it's the way it's like done on film. Like it's not like it doesn't cut to a title card. It's like it's part of the environment. It's part of the environment. Yeah. It makes it's it's very interesting. It's hard to explain. So like I guess you can give an example. Yeah. So like if they're on the there's one part where they're on the beach and then like some character gets shot and the blood spells something out. You know, and that's not, that's not original. Other movies have done this. Right. It's just that this movie did it very well because it's not only like blood splatters. Sometimes it's like roots in the ground. Other times it's roots smoke, in the ground, smoke and fire coming um, in, like blowing in a certain direction. Soap it's, on a toilet seat. Soap on a toilet seat. Yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of it. And it's just, it's really well done. It makes for really good scene transitions. But we talked about this when we were talking about Justice League. I like chapters in movies. I think it's perfectly appropriate in, in any movie. Like, here's a movie that's not... It's not four hours long, like Justice League, and yet no. it has maybe, it's still like... broken up into chapters, in a in a way. It might have, like, eight or nine chapters. It has, it has a bunch. Yeah. But it works like, like a novel does. Like, you get a... Just by the chapter name, you get a taste of what's to come. Yeah. You know, and it's... Without it necessarily being spoiled exactly. before it happens. It's a yeah. nice kind of, like, a... Like a, like like a little like palate teaser. Appetizer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like an appetizer. So yeah, overall great movie, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. So let's just go spoilers. If you have not seen this movie, just stop listening. <laughs> stop listening and watch the movie and then come back. Yeah. So here we go. We're talking spoilers. We're still talking um Justice League God, Justice League Suicide Squad. I've done that before because it's like two team names. Yeah. And it's word and type of team. The this team. Like a league and a squad. <laughs> justice suicide you know what i'm saying like they're similar in the suicide squad the justice league if... <laughs> this movie is very anti-bird you notice that yes but i believe there's a reason for it here's the thing it's very anti-bird and very pro rodent because a, obviously a lot of birds die in this movie every bird but one bird you see in this yes. movie dies but every bird that you see die is in captivity and the one bird you don't see die is free out in the open. No, the first one's not in captivity. He was in the prison with them. Okay, but he can fly away. It's metaphorical. <laughs> okay. All the other birds were literally in cages. I guess that's true. I think it's a whole like you know yeah. like free bird thing or sure sure cage yeah, no, no, bird no, no, no. thing. Cage bird is like a popular metaphor. Yeah, yeah. That could be it. Yeah. I'll, for me, I was like, does he hate birds? Like, what is? I don't his, think James Gunn hates birds. <laughs> <laughs> Some people are scared of birds. A lot, actually, a lot of people are scared of birds. Huh. Anyway, no rodents die in this movie, and there's a bunch on screen. Yeah. Weasel oh, doesn't die. We don't die. see any die. <laughs> yeah. Weasel survives, by the way. We, <laughs> they make it seem like he died. Yeah. And then just for good measure, he survives because he's very pro-rodent. So the first spoiler we were saving is uh, TDK. In this, he's called the Detachable Kid. But he is Arm Fall Off Boy. From the is, DC Comics. Who is a real character. And his superpower... Again, it's another from the 50s. His only superpower is like he can rip his arms off and use them as clubbing weapons. And then his arm will grow back. Which is a really lame power. Even if you have that as a superpower, why wouldn't you just get a baseball bat? Then you don't have to wait for your arm to grow back. Also, also that arms, hurts. It probably hurts him for one. And two, like, arms aren't a great weapon. They're mostly, like, flab. <laughs> they're um, they're dense. Yeah, but because of the elbow, they're not, like, stiff, you know? That's true. Like, if you hit someone with your elbow, okay, sure. It'd probably be better to hit someone with a leg than just an arm. Just buy a baseball bat, man. <laughs> like, I just don't get it. But, so, But in this movie, he detaches his arms and they just slowly float towards the people. And he just starts slapping people, like, yeah, banging them on the head. He just kind of annoys them. Yeah, <laughs> I love that the soldiers just kind of stop and are like, "What are you doing?" And they just start shooting the shit <laughs> they just out of them. Shoot the arms. Why didn't he just like grab their guns or something? Like give them wedgies. I don't anything else. <laughs> but if you noticed when they showed his uh, status, he was never confirmed dead. It just said critical condition. 
Did, did they shoot his body or was he writhing in pain because his arms are getting shot? I thought I saw like blood flying out of his body when he was writhing in pain, but maybe it was just his arms getting shot. If he's if his arms are getting shot and they're already detached, then that can't kill him, right? But maybe he still feels it. But like it said like all these other people like deceased, 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 but then it showed him and just said critical condition. That's a good detail. I wonder <laughs> he, if he he's... might be alive. Oh wow. Uh, uh, good old Nathan <laughs> Fillion. <laughs> yeah, hey. Did you see that they were petitioning for the Nathan Fillion Civilian Pavilion in Edmonton, Canada. I like that name. Right, so, and uh, he's from Edmonton, and uh, I guess they wanted to uh, <laughs> name a random like park pavilion, the Nathan Fillion, Fillion Civilian, Civilian pavilion. pavilion. I like it just because it rhymes. And like, it's there's, funny. There's like petitions going around. Well, to, it's like, funny, make and it... people love Nathan Fillion. <laughs> so, Nathan Fillion is an actor who I guess is famous because everyone tells me he is, and yet I've never seen him in anything. He's like uh, one of those. He has like a cult following. He's most From famous what, for though? Firefly. Okay, I get it. So like, because I, I, I go on his IMDb, I'm like, oh, he's done a lot of stuff. It's just a coincidence that everything he's been in is something that I have specifically never seen. Firefly is his most famous. He's the main character in Firefly. Uh, okay, like, okay, he's okay. the star. So that's where he that comes from. Yeah, he plays a very like Han Solo esque character in there. Hmm, okay, that's where I mostly know him from. He's in Doctor Horrible Sing Along Blog, which is like a fun little musical starring him and neil patrick harris <laughs> oh it's an interesting almost comic book like musical i may have to check that out then <laughs> it's made by joss whedon i don't know if that's gonna ruin it for you uh, uh, oh <laughs> yeah <laughs> but so is firefly so on the topic of like subverting you know the genre or subverting the expectations like we were talking about like no one has plot armor or famous person armor this movie starts off with michael rooker Right. Yeah, they kind of paint him as like the point of view character that we're going to be following. Exactly, exactly. He's the perspective character for the whole first 10 minutes. That is an ex, like a subversion of like the storytelling. Yeah. Because those things tell the viewer subconsciously, this guy's safe because he is your audience surrogate, right? He's the one following him. Exactly. And we learn things as he learned things. Right. If you put a character on screen who doesn't know what's going on, then you, that's an excuse to explain things and info dump onto the audience. Which right? is what they did the first like 10 minutes. Yeah. They get you caught up on what the Suicide Squad is. Right. Yeah. And then you get to the beach scene and he dies. He is. He, the he runs Chekhov's, away. Yeah. He's the Chekhov's uh, brain bomb. Right. Yeah. And so then he, we get the opening credits. <laughs> exactly. So it, within 10 minutes, like he's already dead. Yeah. Yeah. It's such as like when you go back and rewatch the movie, you're like, this is such a smart use of like not informing the audience at all who is safe and who can die. Yeah. You know, because I thought for a split second, they're going to kill Harley and like break flag on this beach and we're not going to see him for the rest of the movie. Which and they could have done. They could have. And then I remembered that I saw trailers and there's more scenes with them. Oh. <laughs> so I was like, oh, they're safe. But that's why I'm like, don't watch the trailers. Like, this is not a movie you should watch trailers for. No. Pete Davidson gets his face blown off. <laughs> yeah. What was his plan? Because <laughs> as soon as he defects, Amanda Waller is going to blow his brain off. Yeah, well, I think, so what's the I think he was just an idiot. Did they think that they were going to like fix it for him? Like get the chip There's out no or something? There's no way he'd have time. Yeah, exactly. Like, she would have got you by then. Yeah. So he, His plan was bad. Well, I think the whole point is that he's stupid. Yeah. Like, he doesn't well, know how he, to put he, on his seatbelt right. Yeah, like, he, he was afraid. <laughs> He's afraid of werewolves. Yeah. <laughs> He's easily convinced that that thing's a werewolf. Peacemaker, I really hated. And and it's... In a good way? Yes. Okay. Like, you're supposed to hate him. Yes. Like, he turns out to be kind of a bad guy. So... He was almost, like, the main antagonist, sort of. I think as far as human characters are concerned, yeah. Because, yeah. like, the military guys, the Corto Maltesians... Are like joke characters. They're and, yeah, not even yeah. And there's a gag that every president just keeps getting killed. <laughs> like, <laughs> like we go through like three presidents through that whole through yep. the whole uh, thing. We do, but, but that yeah, peacemaker, it was a good twist. Yeah, yeah, sure. He had a like a special task that he was given, you know, yeah. to make sure that the the data was um was kept. I know we're kind of talking about characters, but like this is exactly like I said what a suicide squad movie should be like they should be going abroad and like toppling governments they should be doing some dark ops cia shit exactly what they yeah this was yeah well because they're not not exactly their assignment but no no no. because 
like their assignment was not to be heroes and to do anything about Starro. Their assignment was to delete the fucking information so that the American government doesn't look culpable. Yeah. Yep, and that That's was it. it. She didn't give a shit about what Starro does. Well, They're not heroes. Fucked. <laughs> yeah, they decided to be heroes and 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 fight the giant monster. And Waller was gonna blow them up for it. Exactly. For some reason, like, huh? She got yeah. She got really unnecessarily mad there. Like, I thought that was a bit of a stretch. Like, all right, actually. so you're gonna kill them because they're probably gonna die fighting this monster. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm like, all right, good luck. Like, <laughs> hopefully you come back. <laughs> he does a good job, John Cena. He does. Um, and he has a TV show for Peacemaker coming out, which I'm actually interested in so, seeing. Now, I thought they were gonna do a prequel TV show. Yeah, because we're under the impression that he gets killed in this movie. He gets shot in the throat. So I was like, yeah. oh, cool, he's dead. Thank God. You know, he got his comeuppance. Yeah. But I guess he survives, and they're going to make a TV show, I guess, with Outside Dave from uh, New Girl. Yeah. And apparently what James Gunn said was that the show is going to be a lot more science fiction than you would think. Whatever that means. I mean, it's movie science fiction. Like... Yeah. But it's like when you think of like just a Peacemaker series, like you think like, oh, this guy's just going to go around shooting women and children. Yeah. <laughs> In I the love... name of freedom. I love peace. <laughs> No, like, I, love, I love peace. I don't care how many men, women, and children I have to kill to achieve it. <laughs> His character is like such a exaggerated version of like a um, American nationalist. So there's a term for it. It's called uh, jing, jinguist, I think it is. Hold on, let me look okay. it Okay. And it is a an extreme nationalist oh, so, who... Okay. Um, it's nationalism in the form of aggressive and proactive foreign policy such as a country's advocacy for the use of threats or actual force as opposed to peaceful relations and efforts to safeguard what it perceives as its national interests that's peacemaker yep <laughs> so what yeah, a joke. it's extreme yeah, what a joke <laughs> so extreme almost to the point of irony uh nationalism yeah like the like, worst captain america ever <laughs> yeah it's like how do you honestly kind of like what john walker was for a little bit in the comics Maybe, yeah. Obviously, yeah. not this extreme. Like, this is no, ironically this is, extreme. This is like, yeah, yeah that's it's borderline. Um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Satire. Yeah, maybe a little bit. So Harley Quinn. So here's the thing, and I wanted to kind of talk about this. Is definitely a sequel in a bunch of ways. Obviously, in one like that, like we said, this is episodic. You can ignore the last one if you wanted to. They don't connect story wise however james gunn takes full advantage of the fact that another suicide squad movie exists yeah he spends very little time introducing the premise like it's not like amanda waller is also again talking to the senators and be like i want to set up task force x what is task force x i'm going to put together but a team it's, of very it already people. exists it in al- this movie it already exists and they explain it to you in a manner of minutes and captain boomerang and harley even like have like an exchange yeah. they remember each they other they know each other they're friends and that they, they play to that when Captain Boomerang dies. And yeah. Harley's like, fuck, like, you're my friend. And, and like, uh, she's really excited to see Rick Flagg. Yeah, too. and her and Rick Flagg are also friends. I love that she's kind of like almost voluntarily like back on the Suicide Squad. She's like, yeah, this is great. I'm back with my friends. <laughs> like, she, well, got she caught. has nothing like, else to do. She got caught, but she didn't seem too like bent out of shape about it. You yeah. Know? <laughs> she was what, robbing a bank or something? She said, uh, she said she had road rage inside a bank. Oh, okay. So I guess she like, Took the car in the bank. I don't know if she was robbing. Anyway. She probably drove into a bank. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, it, igno- it acknowledges that the last movie existed to its advantage. So it doesn't have to explain the premise of Suicide Squad. But, like, again, if this was a total reboot, you would have. You yeah. know, he's basically saying, like, people are aware that that movie existed. We're making a sequel. Yeah, it's going to be completely different. It's going to be way better. But, like, everyone knows what the Suicide Squad is now. So, like, we can move on We don't on have to quickly. waste time. We don't have to waste time. We just go right into it. And, again, uh, like you said, a lot of those relationships are already pre-built into the movie. Now, they allude to a lot of that. And they kind of inform the viewer that, you know, they already know each other. They're already close. Like, Rick Flag and Harley are friends because they've worked together for a long time. You don't need to see that movie to know that. But it kind of helps if you already yeah. did and you already knew that information. I'm not saying go back and rewatch Suicide Squad. I'm just saying, like, <laughs> it does benefit in this movie, if nothing else. Yeah. Like, you benefit from knowing that information. So, for Harley, I think this is also a very consistent character arc for all three of her movies. Because that was something else I was worried about. I'm like, okay, are going to be in, in Birds of Prey? She's also going to be in this movie. Are these two movies even related? We didn't know at the time. Yeah. And now it's like, well, they are. And not only that, James Gunn has 
paid careful attention to her character arc in those last two movies. He didn't do something with his character that contradicts that. He does no. something that complements that. You She's know, a lot more like liberated in this movie. She's... Yes. And specifically, like, the lessons she learned in Birds of Prey, she applies very quickly when she starts seeing red flags in this guy. To, to it, like, almost an extreme extent. <laughs> I love that it's a literal Chekhov's gun where, like, they crash into the guns while they're, like, about to oh, have yeah. sex. And all the guns fall on the floor. And I'm like, that's a lot of guns. Why are they there? One's going to get shot. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. There's a little bit of lampshade in there where she's like, why did this gun have a bullet in it? Like, they're just decorative. Like, it's like she was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she was probably going to kill him in a different way. She was like, I might as well try if this has a bullet in it. I love that scene, not just for thematically, like, what it does for Harley and her character, but, like, I didn't see that coming at all. I was genuinely surprised. Yeah. Like, again, James Gunn is taking storytelling techniques to subvert the genre, subvert the, your expectation of what is going to happen. You expect this to be the big bad, big bad guy. That's how the movie paints him to be. And he's giving like his monologue kind yeah. of like and just explaining what he's going to do. Sure. And like we're at the 45 minute mark. He gets shot. He's dead. There's okay. a new president. New president. That guy dies too. Okay. There's a fourth president eventually like for like half a second before the freedom fighters march in. Yeah. But yeah. Also Harley's character. That's what we're talking about. What yeah. Saying. Those lessons that she learned in Bird of Prey. She's a lot more liberated. She, like. I actually noticed her tattoo. It was the one on her back shoulder where it used to say uh, property of Joker. In this movie, it says property of no one. You're joking, really? Yeah. I didn't see that at all. <laughs> but she, it still says uh, Daddy's Little Monster up front on her shoulder. I'm th- Like her back shoulder. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, but her front oh, still front, says Daddy's Little Monster. Yeah. I think that's just a... Whoever who's, Daddy who's is. Who's Daddy? Always a new Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so cool. It says... uh. Property of no one. Yeah. I need to look that up. Well, she had a bunch of J's on her, too. I wonder if those are gone. I'd have to... Honestly, I gotta watch the movie again. She wears a lot more clothing in this one, so it's hard to tell. Yeah. Because in the first Suicide Squad movie, which which got a little bit of heat for being, like, you know, putting her in, she's like... literally in her underwear. Basically in underwear the whole movie. She's got a right, like, above her waist, or, like, right on her waist that says, Lucky You. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, best Harley costume, so by far. The one she wears in the beginning. Yeah. That thing's beautiful. That is a costume right there. <laughs> it's good. It is the closest to the comics without being ridiculous. You know, it's yeah. good. Because her, her original outfit from like the animated series and then eventually the comics is... It's ridiculous. It's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, it's a, it's a little Harlequin yeah. uh, outfit. But it has all that same motif in it. You know, it's red, black. It's got like diamonds on it. Mm-hmm. I think she has like HQ, like on her belt buckle. She looks badass. It's, and it still like feels like it belongs in this DC universe. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like, I feel like if we see her some more, I want her in that. Obviously she looks cool in the fucking random red dress. They put her in that she rips up to use as yeah. like, weapons, but Oh my God, that costume was great. Also, another thing that he paid close attention to is like, the specific cinematography for her character is consistent. So like a lot of times when you see Harley Quinn, she lives in a very kind of a dreamlike perspective. Like her point of view is crazy because she's a crazy person and she's on like the Joker chemicals. So she's on a similar wavelength where like her reality is like trippy. You know what I mean? Yeah, Like all Uh, the time, like all the time. That's just how she is. And that's why like certain things just don't like stick with her and, you know, she has empathy for her for some things and none, not for other things. And she's yeah. kind of psychotic and whatever. You look back at, like, her scenes with Joker and Suicide Squad, like, some of them are very dreamlike. In, uh, I think, Birds of Prey, there's a part where, like, she sees nothing but that one sandwich and she's, like, in slow motion. Yeah. There's a bunch of things like that. And so in this one where she's having, like, the little love affair with the president. Like, it is very dreamlike, and at one point, they're just floating on, like, towards each other. Because this is what she sees in her head, basically. They also do a lot of the... I forget what this film technique is called. But it's when you move the camera forwards or backwards while simultaneously zooming in or out to counteract that effect. And what that does... I'm going to show you examples. But what that does is that it keeps the subject exactly where it is. But everything in the background changes... And it feels really weird. Okay. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like it yeah, feels. They do it like during 
do they do it during like that fight scene she has where she's also you're seeing it like from her perspective where she's seeing yeah. like the mm-hmm. you do it there the birds flying everywhere the uh, birds that don't get killed oh hey, hey yeah i think yeah. you might be right then about the the thing they do it when she's like dating the guy for that montage right and then, and then he does it again when um she sees all of the soldiers and she's rocking both machine guns yeah. they do it again there it's a very they did it in malcolm in the middle a bunch it's the only thing i can think of but there's I think like I know some, what you're talking about there's We're... horror movies where they do it too it, it's <laughs> very they do un... it malcolm in the middle <laughs> they do it in malcolm in the middle a lot yeah it's very um unsettling because basically you see the backgrounds kind of shift in perspective but the foreground stays exactly the same so it just makes you feel uncomfortable yeah, just okay. some yeah yeah yeah. I'm, I'll show you examples. I'll link examples okay. too if I can remember what it's and, called. And um, that scene where she has like the two machine guns, she's like killing everybody. The flowers. That's, and... Yeah, that's the scene that I was talking about earlier, where it's like the music. I don't think she was necessarily listening to it, but, it's but it was in, in her it head. was playing in her head. Yeah, I would buy that. Yeah, because before that, when she was getting tortured too, she was also singing a song. I don't know if it was the same song. Oh, uh, I don't know. She was singing though. That scene, by the way, uh, Margot Robbie really did that. With the key and the... With the foot and putting her body like that. That's impressive. That's, yeah. She actually did all that. That was pretty cool. Yeah. And then, like, all the flowers coming out of, like, the guns and stuff. And the blood. Yeah, the like, blood is, like, blood flowers. Are, like, flowers. That's yeah. all her perspective. Because when you see that same scene play out from the bad guy's point of view, it, none of that's there. It's horrifying. It's horrifying. It's just blood and they're running or whatever. And then from her point of view, there's, like... Is it Snow White? Yeah, like Snow White little like birds flying around. They're 2D yep. animated because she thinks she's a Disney princess. Yeah. You know what I mean? When she put the dress on, she literally said like, oh my God, <sighs> I'm a princess. Yeah. Like in her mind, that's what she is, even though she's actually like a psychopath. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's done better here than any of those other movies. Mm-hmm. And I need to rewatch Birds of Prey. But it is an attention to like consistency that James Gunn did. And it's interesting because like. It's not like, I mean, yeah, he did work with Marvel where they're like, hey, these are the things that you have to do in order for this to feel like every other Marvel movie. He can't right. do 2D animation like that no. in a Marvel movie. The, and, it would be too big of a shift in like tone. Exactly. But in this, I mean, like he is doing that. He's kind of breaking those walls, those barriers, while also maintaining some consistency in this character with other movies. Which he, is he does good. stuff like this similarly, like with like weird like stuff going on in your head. In another movie that he made called Super. I haven't seen Slither nor Super. Well, Super is a very, very, very uh, R-rated like superhero movie. Oh, okay. <laughs> but it's like one of those, like, he's not actually a superhero, he's just a regular guy. And then, like, it gets it gets kind of grim. Okay, I want to check that out. It's, it's an interesting movie. Polka Dot Man. He had a good character arc, I thought. I really liked him a lot. I didn't think I was going to like him because he seems so. He seems so ridiculous and and weird. This is James Gunn. Like he's going to take a character that you should by all means hate just to show off that he's a good filmmaker because it's dope as fuck. He's going to make him like one of the better characters. Yeah. You know what I mean? And Polka Dot Man was one of the highlights of the movie. So what I think is really funny about Polka Dot Man is that for whatever reason, he's the straight man. Like, he's the one that's normal. Even though he's still weird. He's still weird, and he admits to being weird, and he thinks he's weird, and he thinks he's, like, crazy. But, again, the movie is told mostly by the perspective of the other guys. Your Idris Elba yeah. and, and John Cena and, and um, fucking Rick Flagg and Harley Quinn sometimes. And so he comes off weird or whatever, but he's the normal one, basically. Yeah, yeah even compared to, like, Rick Flagg. Yeah, he's the only one with any empathy because when, he's the only uh, one that noticed uh, Milton. Milton. And he was like mourning his death. He's like, I can't believe Milton or whatever. killed Milton. And everyone's like, who? Uh, fucking uh, uh, Harley <laughs> Quinn didn't even remember him. Bloodsport was like, he was still with us? He's still with us? Yeah, he's right there. I thought he stayed on the bus. No. And if you go back and watch. He holds the door for Harley to walk yeah, through. Yeah, he's always in the background. And I think it's this is done on purpose. It's so that you notice him without noticing him. But yeah. he's always there. Well, even in like the, the shot with all of them like coming out of the smoke, he's just in the side walking with He's the one on the far right. Yeah. <laughs> and it's so funny because he's, he's just walking with them. He's not a suicide squad. Why member. is he with them still? <laughs> Like, he's one of the resistance guys. Yeah. And then he, guys, he's just like, oh, I guess I'm, I'm going to keep helping. Like, why not? I just He's just a good friend. <laughs> like, <laughs> But again, hitting the theme of friendship better than any other movie could. Yeah. Right? Like, 
just that, little that things like that. Funny though, he's the straight man for whatever yeah. reason. He's the one we're supposed to like and he's, relate to. But he he's definitely got like his his mommy issues. Sure, <laughs> yeah, all that was really fun. I was saying it's like a Norman Bates type thing. Well, I mean, they call him Norman yeah. Bates too. I thought it was funny that um, do you think that? The costume people also had to remake every costume specifically for that mom actress. Or is it CGI? I think it's CG. It kind of looks CGI, but I'd be like, that would suck. They're like, all right, now we have to make a peacemaker costume <laughs> specifically for this woman. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's really interesting, though, is that like Polka Dot Man just had polka dots that turned into different things and he could use to like rob banks and stuff. Yeah. It's a ridiculous concept that if you think about it for more than a second, it makes no sense. And yet... James Gunn's like, this is the thing. I'm going to turn this into something. Yeah. Then I'm going to turn into something. And like when he, he explains like this. An interdimensional virus. Yeah. He just has like weird polka dot rashes that he has to like expel. And then they turn into like these like melty things. And for and whatever reason. he doesn't reason, expel them, he like he blows up. I right, guess. right, right, right. Yeah. And so he has natural weapons that he just produces basically. Which is cool. Right. For whatever reason, you buy it. You're like, that's cool. Yeah. You know, you have successfully made Polka Dot Man cool. I care about him. <laughs> I did. And I was really upset when he died. Right after he claimed to be a superhero. But at the beginning of the movie, when they talk about like, oh, we're probably all going to die in this mission. Polka Dot Man like, literally just so. turns and goes, I hope so. <laughs> but I think he has a bit of a character arc because, you he know. He finds purpose. He does. Exactly. And by the end, he's like, I'm a motherfucking superhero. And then he dies. And then he dies. By that point in the movie, I was like, all right, we're already in the third act. They're not going to kill random people randomly anymore. They're only going to kill people for, like, thematic reasons like Rick Flagg when they kill Rick Flagg. I was very upset with because I like that character I started to like him. I didn't care for him in the first movie, I'll admit. But in this movie, I did like him a lot. Yeah. Again, it helps that you already know. Even if you didn't like him in the first movie, it helps that you already know his he who was, he is. He was familiar. Exactly. So they, you know, they can kind of, like, piggyback off that. But oh, by that point at the end, I was like, oh, everyone is safe now. Everyone's going to survive. And then Polka Dot Man gets crushed <sighs> right after he becomes a hero. <laughs> yeah. They could have killed Harley there, too. They, she could have drowned in Starro's eye. Well, I mean, I'm at least glad they didn't kill Harley. I think they have plans for her for more I stuff. I think they do, too. I, I mean, you, I don't think James Gunn would have killed her anyway. No, no, no. You look at the entire DC lineup, every single character, and Harley's in the top three or five yeah of people you want to keep safe because obviously they don't give a shit about like henry cavill and ben affleck's you know he's back and he's gone and i he's wish back they and cared more about henry cavill seriously and so you've got like gal gadot and and then you've got like harley quinn like who's more valuable to dc right now you know what i mean right now probably harley quinn uh, yeah after uh wonder woman 84 yeah but i mean they're gonna keep her safe they're, they're gonna try to do more things with her and i'm happy i like her a lot but yeah Thank God nothing happened to Sebastian. That was the one thing. I'm like, if you <laughs> fucking kill this rat. Because Sebastian's leading the charge at the end. Yeah. And I'm like, if something happens to that goddamn rat, I'm going to be they, very they upset. easily killed him off. I was like, he's not coming back from that. It's going to be a whole thing. Ratcatcher is going to be upset. I ended up liking Ratcatcher a lot, too. I love that, again, he has all these famous names at his disposal. And he takes the unknown actor and makes her, like, one of the key characters in this movie because yeah. a lot of this movie is blood spore and rat catcher yep and then a little bit of rat catcher and with, they have um, like a little bit of like a he's basically failed his daughter he kind of sees rat catcher as like a, another like maybe a second chance i think he just sees like or he just because he straight up says you remind me of my daughter yeah but she's very wholesome and positive and and she's lovely she's all about like friendship friendship and love yeah. and all these and all these wonderful things she shouldn't be a villain by any means like you know what i mean yeah and she is not ashamed of like her relationship with her father and she had a great one and i think he sees her and uh, being a, even though she's like a villain or whatever like a product <laughs> of a great fatherly relationship of which he's not providing to his daughter at all i think that's what he sees yeah if i have a complaint in this movie and i have a, i have probably a couple that I can't really think of, so I guess we're not that big. But I don't think there's that much resolution with Bloodsport's daughter. No, she just sees him on the TV, and she she's has like, some resolution. Like she's yeah. like, "That's my dad. He but, just saved all." But his he people. doesn't, though. No. So I'm like, <laughs> because the last time he, they had that shouting match was actually really funny. No, that was fun. But I feel like they needed to resolve that. They needed to meet one more time yeah. at the end of the movie. Maybe like another like 
Honestly, you could have done that in like two minutes. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if that was like a deleted scene. Yeah. You know, to try to kind of end the movie faster or whatever. But I love the bit where uh, King Shark's just getting left behind all the time. Oh, yeah. Like, all right, we're going this way. Oh, we haven't talked about King Shark much. Yeah, he just turns around. He's like, I guess I'm lost now. (laughs) He starts walking up the stairs. I mean, even King Sharp has character development. Yeah, he learns about friendship. He learns about friendship. He didn't have any friends. He gets uh, betrayed by uh, those fish. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of sad, though. He's like, yeah. oh, new friends. And, and he then gets so excited. They immediately attack him when they get yeah. the chance to. James Gunn purposefully said that they designed King Shark to not look cute. Because when you make a character cute, it's very easy to do. You just give him really big eyes, really yeah. soft features. It's your baby Yodas and like... Yeah. Uh, all, all these other things and they're like we gotta do the opposite of that let's literally make him look like a shark and like a really awkward dad bod and the reason why everyone thinks he's cute is because of how he is exactly it's not like a visual thing it's no a, it's it's a projection that yeah you're putting onto him yeah exactly i yeah, still no, a very really... dangerous monster <laughs> <laughs> no but i thought he was super cute again yeah. again it's the personality him and sebastian were so were like just the cutest i think yeah Sebastian, when he sits on um, Bloodsport's like leg, gets really comfortable, like a little puppy. Uh, and Bloodsport's like scared to touch. He's like, uh, <laughs> that was super cute. I'm glad they gave him a phobia of rats. <laughs> that was fun. I like that they're not super thorough. Like it's it's almost realistic that they're like, oh fuck, like we didn't check if Weasel could swim, <laughs> and like oh goddamn, like we didn't know that he had a phobia of rats and we yeah. lost comms and it's just kind of like yeah, yeah i believe, rats, I believe put him on a shit. team with someone that controls rats yeah i i loved her rat catcher i thought the actress was great yeah uh, she the killed role it was fantastic she injects a lot of heart in the team mm-hmm. teaches them all about friendship whatever and then her dad rat catcher taika watiti yeah so <laughs> my favorite part of this entire movie no joke is that taika watiti delivers the key line in the movie it's almost like the abstract of the film, like <laughs> like an abstract's like the form of sentence of what like this entire movie means or whatever. And there's a part where she goes, why rats, dad? Like, why did you pick rats? And he says, rats are the lowliest and the most despised creatures of all. Yet they have purpose. So do we all. <laughs> and like, that's what this movie is about. It's like, these are all the rats, you know, yeah. but they have to f- learn that they also are useful. They have purpose. They they have meaning. The rats literally saved the day. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. I'm like, why didn't... she's the most powerful one on this team. She can control these rats. With the help of Harley Quinn and Chekhov's javelin. <laughs> that it, she's carrying around the whole movie. It almost literally is Chekhov's javelin because she's like, what does this mean? Why do I have this? <laughs> he, he's not even carry, but he didn't explain why. Why he didn't Chekhov just tell me why I need to use it? Yeah, basically. Oh, the other, other thing I want to talk about, uh, Rick Flag. He's got the shirt, mm-hmm. the yellow one, with the bunny on it. And it's like they're in a foreign country. And they, and they speak Spanish there. It's, right. a, it's a fictional country, Corte Maltese. It's mentioned uh, in the Batman 89 movie. Well, it's a DC fictional country. Yeah. yeah. Is it really? It's uh, one of the places uh, Vicky Vale took pictures at. Huh. Cool. That's a nice little cut. Because Bruce Wayne really says, like, oh, I saw your pictures of Corte Maltese. <laughs> oh wow, yeah, that's awesome. Did you notice that on your, uh, like, on your own? You remember? No, that? I I read that somewhere. Oh, I was like, damn, that's a deep no, that, cut. That's a super. Because we deep saw cut. that movie months ago, yeah. like six months ago. You want to get nuts? Let's get nuts. <laughs> so that shirt he wears, it's got like a bunny, and he's holding a sign, which is a very Bugs Bunny things to do. Which WB Bugs Bunny? Exactly. Yeah. He's also wearing a red cape. Superman. So Bugs Bunny, <laughs> Superman, those are like the two like main characters for WB. Right. Right. At this point, the sign says in Spanish, obstáculos son oportunidades, which means obstacles are opportunities. And I think that's just a straight up like James Gunn thing, like because he was fired from. Oh, absolutely. He's fired from Disney. And but that led to this movie. Yeah. But then again, like he's back. So like, I feel like the back of the shirt should just say like, but actually that obstacle is gone. So it's just many opportunities. Well, the <laughs> fact that the obstacle was there in the first place is what created that opportunity. I guess. So yeah. it, it kind of works. But it's a nice. That's clever. I thought it's a nice little like uh, kind of a little bit of his heart and soul that he put in the movie. Also, when Rick Fly gets killed, he gets stabbed in the heart through the shirt. Yeah. And I think that's also a bit of that. Like he, Guardians was his passion, basically. Yeah. And, he, and he was 
for a minute there or for six months completely robbed of it he was like uh, stabbed in the heart stabbed in the heart and he put that in a movie too okay i thought it was really clever yeah damn We've talked about most of the protagonists. What about like the villains? Though? What about like Starro? I forgot to talk about Starro. The thinker. The so, U.S. government. The U.S. government. Let's talk about them for an hour, huh? <laughs> I Yeah, I forgot to mention Starro, who is a Justice League villain from like... Is he another deep cut character? Pre- yes. Okay. Because he's not in a lot. Starro Wasn't the Conqueror. There, do you know how the starfish like attached onto people? Like on their faces? Wasn't yes. there something that did that in the Snyder Cut? Wasn't there like little mechanical stars that attach to people? Yeah, they just read their minds. Oh, okay. It wasn't like it wasn't like a hive mind creature like this, like you see in um Rick and Morty and in uh Oh, that was such a Rick in, and Morty thing, actually. In, 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 Shit. In, in, invincible. There's one in Invincible, invincible too. Yeah. Oh, the it's Mars literally the, the things same that attack thing. Mar- the Martians. Yeah, and they just attach to your face. Yeah. So I I meant to look up like what originated all that. Is it Starro or is it something else? Because it, that's a trope, you know. It is a trope. Yeah, so Starro debuted in Brave and the Bold. You can already tell it's old, but it's like a present. The fact that it's the Brave and the Bold comics. Well, well, yeah, <laughs> but it's a which also it was the first appearance of the Justice League. Uh-huh. So in the first well, appearance of the Justice League, they're fighting Starro. Wait, so the that Conqueror. was the first person that the Justice League fought was Starro, the Conqueror. Yep. Wow. Well, there was already the Justice, the Justice Society. That was Justice a little bit Society. older. Oh, okay. Is he like how he is in this movie in the comics? I I don't know. <laughs> you're asking me a lot. Hold oh, on. Oh man, you're the DC guy. I know. I <laughs> I looked up everybody else except for Starro. <laughs> he was in a uh, Batman Beyond. Was he really? He was in a two part episode. What? Called, and the name of the episode is called The Call. I didn't see all of Batman Beyond, but I saw most of it. <laughs> I thought uh, Ratcatcher Two, I think, is in in Batman Beyond. Oh okay. That makes sense because because it's later, yeah. Yeah, Terry is basically Batman too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, Star is an intelligent alien life form resembling a giant starfish with central eye and prehensile extremities. The entity visited Earth and empowered three starfishes, creatures wreaking havoc, exploding, blah 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 blah, kidnapping <laughs> scientists and absorbing their brain power and placing the residents of Happy Harbor and Rhode Island under mental control. So this movie gave him a little bit more of a sympathetic origin. I didn't feel sorry for him at all. He wanted to take over. Well, he, he didn't want he out. Was, he was just floating in space, and then yeah, but he's also the stung. U.S. government took him. Yeah, his last words were literally, "I was happy floating through space, staring at the stars." Yeah, that is true. <laughs> so I think all he really wanted was freedom. He is an absolute dick for enslaving and killing almost an entire city. Yeah, but I think Amanda Waller is worse. Also, it's cool that. James Gunn used a giant alien as, like, the final bad guy in this. Again, I've been saying, I don't think the Suicide Squad should be doing stuff like this. And yet, James Gunn did it, and it right. worked. Well, this also wasn't, it wasn't their mission to do this. Right, they exactly. They just chose to do this because they were there. Yeah, they felt and, heroic at the moment. Well, also, right? like, they didn't want to just let people die. There was a whole, um, the whole reason why Rick Flagg died is because Rick Flagg was trying to be a hero. Yeah. Like, y- you find out that... I like that. Their mission is to just cover up what the U.S. government did here. Rick Flagg's like, no, that's not right. Again, he's the only one there who volunteered. Like, that's yeah. his job. He's like, I'm not fucking doing this shit. He's like, I thought I signed up to the military for a reason. Yeah. If I were him, I would have just, you know, let Peacemaker take the hard drive and just figure it out later. Like, yeah, maybe not the die back. right there. Like, I know you're you're super proud or whatever, but it wasn't smart. Maybe shoot him in the back later or something like that. He was also, I think, just being emotional. Yeah, yeah. Because exactly. he was pissed. Because <laughs> he he was the one guy there that was like legitimately a good guy. I think it's one of the reasons I like Rick Flag more in this one. <laughs> but I think that's all I have. Like I said, I I was gonna say that I didn't like blood sports weapons. They felt a little bit too like Iron Manny. And I I like how they were like like modular weapons though. Like you'd like take pieces off and attach. Yeah, it. but it almost seems like technology that I don't believe that they have. You know what I mean? I don't know. That's also from the comic. Like, that's one of the reasons they picked him. Right. Although I do like that, even though he is clearly kind of a fill-in for Deadshot, they make a joke about how, like, they're, like, almost a dime a dozen. <laughs> like, people like Deadshot, Bloodsport, Peacemaker, they all do the same thing. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like, I thought you said you picked, like, different 
He's, skill sets. So I thought you said everyone's picked for their unique skill set. He does the same thing I do. And he's like, well, I do it better. <laughs> their competition was... That was hilarious. Yeah. That was really good. The death touch scene, I thought, was a bit much. But you remember when we talked about lampshading? Like, he lampshades everything so well that you're like, ah, all right, I'll take it. Yeah. Because there's that scene where he's like, you ever heard of, like, the death touch? And then he, the bad guy is like... Yeah, but that's just like that's, that's a myth. There's that's no not way. Real. There's no way anyone can learn to do it like with consistency or whatever. And then all three of them do it. And then all three of them do well, it. Well, all three of them were also like the trained fighters of the group, so it kind of makes sense that if anyone could do it, it would be those three. Yeah, but I was like, well, that's a really quick way to get out of this scene because <laughs> all three of them were military too. Yeah, and they're like the I, best of the best. Yeah, and I think Rick Flag and Bloodsport served together. Is that mentioned? Yeah, they know each other. Because they, they were like friends. Yeah. Yeah. Peacemaker is the douchebag that nobody really knows or cares right, about. <laughs> right, Uh And I talked about how like there was no, resol- no resolution to Bloodsport's daughter bit. No. I guess those were the only things I really didn't like about the movie, but for the most part. I think... Overall. I think that fantastic. would be my only complaint would be the, the no resolution. Okay, cool. And the fact that I think the thinker was kind of underutilized. He's just, he's just really there to just like move the plot forward. yeah <laughs> yeah just like drop the exposition and be like unclutch your pearls <laughs> yeah <laughs> you laughed when he said that too because it's an extreme use of that phrase <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's not like, like like we're talking about the american government like stealing a starfish and mind controlling people it's a whole different like it's also like that'd be a terrifying thing to learn yeah exactly <laughs> God forbid you're shocked. <laughs> so um, I think that's pretty much all I have. Yeah. I do feel like we're missing some like minor things, but it's okay. We've talked a lot about this movie. Yeah. So uh, final thoughts, I guess. Great movie. Um, it uses its R rating very well. Like the violence is over the top, but not in a. It didn't gross me out or anything. Does I, that make sense? I mean, it's gross in a lot it's, of parts. It's gross, it's but it was. But I'm not like, oh man, I can't watch that. You know. It works. The last movie should have been rated R. And I think this is another thing where it's like it does it better than the last one because it was able to secure that R rating. Because the Suicide Squad, when you think about what they are, it just does not work in any way no. if it's not R rated. Like, I feel like main... if they did Deadpool PG 13, yeah, it would really work. The, the main premise they're sticking bombs in people's brains, and therefore we have to see one go off. And when they did it in the last movie, you didn't see an ounce of blood. They just show him, like, kind of dangling there, and you're like, oh, shit, his brains or whatever, but you don't see it. No. You know, and this is, like, obviously... You, you show the head exploding. Yeah. And when you have, like, Guardians of the Galaxy, because that's kind of, like, the matching piece to from Marvel, right? Like, they're fighting aliens and shit, and, like, when you cut up an alien and it bleeds blue blood, like, it almost... It doesn't There's something count. not as um, grotesque. It's, it's not real, so it doesn't yeah. count, and they don't get the R rating. Despite how much blue and green blood there is in those movies, like well, there's actually a there's lot. There's a ton. Drax goes in a like this creature and just starts and cuts his way out. And of starts it. hacking his way out and then comes out completely covered in its guts. But it's yellow, so it's fine. And it's an alien, yeah. so it's fine. You know what I mean? The second it's real human red blood, then it's a big problem, <laughs> right? But the gar- the Suicide Squad is earthbound and they're killing other humans, so like. Yeah. Okay, like, There's a point in the movie where they kill their allies. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it has to be R-rated. Which is actually a really funny scene. Too. So when you compare it to the last movie that had putty monsters, basically. The putty patrol? Yeah. They're, yeah, it's the putty patrol. They're like googly-eyed monsters. I'm having monsters. deja vu. Did we talk about the putty patrol in another movie? Dragon Ball. There was putty patrol in the That's Dragon right. Ball. Yeah. It yeah. was just like rock monsters that he fought. <laughs> we mentioned putty patrol. I'm like, we talked about this. I feel like we're going to be seeing more Putty Patrol, honestly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, last one. they All the bad guys are Putty Patrol. That way, they can just shoot them, and it's not an R rating because they're not humans. Yeah. And they're not bleeding, right? But, like, that doesn't work. You know, like, the Suicide Squad should always have been R rated. And like you said, since he was able to secure that R rating, he does the most he can with it. And, yeah, there's some yeah. crazy, like, throat slashing going on, but it's... It's fun in like a gruesome Tarantino way. Yeah, or like a like you know like Mortal Kombat's like hyper violent, but like yeah. you don't really think anything of it. You're not like oh god. It's part of the fun. Yeah, it's part of the charm. It's uh. it's just weird because like 
It'd be different if it was like all this was happening and the tone was like a lot darker and more like horror esque. Yeah. Then it'd be like, oh god, that's kind of like no, disturbing to right. see. It is, it is grotesque comedy. Yeah. Yeah. I love the part where um the one guy that they kill, he just woke up, he's just stretching, he's got his dick out, and they kill him. <laughs> yeah. They kill some lady that's just singing and doing laundry. Yeah. I'm just I'm saying specifically but, like the use oh, of nudity. Oh oh yeah. You, like he falls down, you see his dick like, just like fly flat back. backwards. That was hilarious. That's a great use of a penis you shot. You see tits for like half a second. That, that was just for good measure. I feel like I just I feel throw, like, yeah, naked. throw it in because we can't throw. Yeah, just might as well use the titties. Was that a strip club or was it just a CD bar? No, it was a gentleman's club. Okay, so yeah, they, and that's where uh, Palm Clementif yeah. is in. Also. She was one of the dancers. Was, I know it's for the second time. There's a lot of people from Guardians of the Galaxy in this movie. Yeah, they're all his favorite actors. <laughs> All his friends. Yeah, exactly. That's how you know you're a good director when you, you're like... When your the, friends follow you to other projects? Yeah, like you make a good environment in a workplace and they, yeah. they have fun. And everybody always has good things to say about James Gunn. Yeah, Cohen. for sure. The Gentleman's Club is called uh, La Gatita Amable, which means the friendly kitten in Spanish. <laughs> uh, but I guess if you think about it a lot, you can probably you can... think of something else that that could be allu- oh, uh, alluding to. You don't to. even have to think about it a lot. <laughs> For a gentleman's club. Think about it for half a second. You'd get the idea. It's pussy. Anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. No, great movie. Full use of the R rating. Beautiful action. Great character-driven stuff. Great thematic stuff. I didn't mention any of the cinematography, but, like, James Gunn and his cinematographer has just a really good eye for... It's not, like, a super overly artistic film, like we've said before, like, what something Zack Snyder would do. It's, like putting the color palettes and and lighting and dark in very specific places like so it looks like a graphic novel right it looks like a more realistic movie like a marvel movie and yet he really composes some really beautiful shots the colors specifically i I like a lot where you've got the ultra dark like night beach scene which is almost hard to watch if you watch it in the daytime like (laughs) i watched it this morning i had to to close all the blinds oh like you can really see yeah but then in Harley Quinn's like perspective scenes where she's like having her little romance with that guy, it's very ultra colorful. Everything's like vivid. and It's incredibly yeah. vivid. Yeah. And then when they're in the rubble, everything's kind of grayed out. So like there, there's a very smart, subtle cinematography going on here. Whereas in the last movie, everything was just dark. Yeah. And like kind of blue. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like I was saying, character stuff, action stuff. This movie's really good. It proves that the last movie could have been a lot better if it yes. was done better. Again, it's an after the fact proof of concept. It doesn't make that movie better in retrospect, but it does serve as a very good sequel. Yeah. Very much and so. And honestly, I'd say this is like one of the better DC movies that have come out. I heard a lot of people go like, oh my God, finally a good DC movie. And I'm like, there have been, a, set, there've been a few. There's and you a said few. that last time. You said that when Zack Snyder's Justice League came out. You said that when Wonder Woman, the first one, happened. <laughs> you said that when Shazam happened and Birds of Prey. And like every, and I know some people hate all of those movies I just listed. Like yeah. Opinions get very divided back and forth. Some people really hate Birds of Prey and Shazam. And some people really like those movies. And I'm like, okay, cool. But we can all agree that they're competent. You know? It's yes. not, like they're, they're, they're good. Yeah. Like, there's even stuff to really like. I know you don't like Aquaman. I like a lot of Aquaman, and there's stuff that I admit is not very good in those in that movie, but, like, I overall like it. It's exciting, and it's fun, and it's a bit of a romp. And It's better in concept. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, this is probably a top three for the DCEU. I don't know how I would rank it with anything else, but, yeah, this is obviously one of the better ones, if not the yeah. best one. It's definitely one of the most fun ones. For sure. And for me, it's hard to compare. I don't like ranking stuff like this because, like, even, like, they're, we said with Marvel movies. They're wildly different. They're wildly different. And it's like, when we talk about Marvel movies, I'm like, to me, I can't call Endgame and Infinity War even movies because they're more like events. Yeah. So, like, I don't know how to stack them up against, like, an Iron Man movie or, like, a Cap movie or, like, a Guardians. Like, I don't know. Like, they're hard to compare. They're apples and oranges. Yeah. And the DC universe so far has been even wildlier different sometimes for for the worst like how do you compare shazam with like Zack Snyder's justice league they're not even the same type of movie it's nice that they exist in the same universe but they're completely different yeah. so i'm like shazam's yeah, this... a christmas movie a bit lighthearted. it's very family actually it was oriented. darker than i thought it'd be though when i watched it 
Like, the villain's origin is kind of, like... Yeah, maybe. Fucked up. <laughs> I don't know if I can rank it, but I can I can definitely say this movie's fantastic. Okay. And I, I would really, agree. I really like it. I still can't tell if I love it, but I really, really like it. Okay. I think I love it. Oh, that's cool. But yeah, it has, like, this James Gunn charm to it that I really like. It balances the humor and the emotion very well. Like, there were some characters that when they died, I felt something, you know? Oh, yeah, like we said. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Rick Flagg, I was pissed off about. Mm -hmm. Polka Dot Man, I was sad about. That hasn't happened to me with a lot of these DC movies where I, like, feel something. I felt some stuff in a lot of them. Not all of them. I didn't feel much in Wonder Woman 84 or Aquaman. But some of the other ones, I thought that they have they have emotionality for sure. Not the first Suicide Squad either. <laughs> so about like half of them, let's say. Yeah. Well, hey, that's our review for the Suicide Squad. And also, we talked a little bit about the first Suicide Squad, also 2016. So. Yeah, we kind of reviewed two movies in one go. So. Yeah, but hey, cool. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you to that piano dude for our musical intro. Make sure you leave a rating and review on Apple or any other thing you can leave a rating or review. Oh, hey, guess what, Birdo? What? We got a really nice review, and so I thought I would just read it because... <laughs> it's, you... Is it one of our first? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, we have listeners. I see them. But, but we never few, hear from them. Very few leave reviews, so finally we got a review, so I thought I would just give them a nice shout-out. This is from Oyve12 on Apple. Five stars, love it. Excellent. A great listen. They do extensive research. Request Spider Man 3. Heart emoji, thumbs up emoji. Whoa. Oh, and five stars emoji, because I think that's not part of. Yeah, yeah, she did the five stars emoji. Oh, also. okay, okay. I, I don't know why I this is a great Well, thank you. Thank you so much. That was so nice. And we will eventually get to Spider Man 3. Yeah, we're kind of kind of on like the super back burner, because I'm like, if we go through all the popular ones, I'm just going to be left with a bunch of movies from the 70s. So. We have those wonderful movies from the 2010s. <laughs> oh, Amazing, Amazing Spider-Man. Spider yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we'll probably do those first before we, we, we touch up on the Sam Raimi ones. Yeah. Because that's kind of like, that's what everybody wants. It's what everybody wants. So we got to save it. We're going to subvert the, the genre. <laughs> we're going to tell everyone we're going to talk about Spider-Man and we're going to be like, hey, how did you guys feel about Andrew Garfield? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> so thank you for that review, guys. If uh, you want to leave a nice review... Maybe I'll read it out loud, because that's that made me really happy. Also, tell a friend. Please and thank you, if you told a friend. Uh, you can find us on Instagram, at Films from the Phantom Zone, and you can find us to argue with us on Twitter, at Films from PZ. All these episodes are available on YouTube as podcasts, if that's how you want to listen to podcasts, if that's how you consume your podcasts, on your desktop computer, while you're working from home, whatever it may be. If you want to support the show, we have a Patreon. And also, we live stream these episodes on Twitch, every monday or most mondays we take a bunch off actually so yeah well we so most mondays we'll be here around 9 30 eastern time yes but we do have lives so not every monday hey if you want to be a part of the podcast if you ever are screaming at us because you think we're idiots and you want to contribute and just like talk to us while we do this and maybe be featured on the show you can actually do that because all this is on twitch while we record it is not the polished finished product that you hear here uh we have arguments about who's cooler harrison ford or samuel L. jackson yeah uh, i get yelled at for not watching 007 we drink we eat play with my dog sometimes my wife comes in and interrupts <laughs> us so all that is fun stuff you can only get live on twitch on twitch.tv slash films from pz so i think that's pretty much it you got anything else birdo oh that's all all right cool guys well we will see you next week with whatever episode we're doing Either X-Men or Steel? Yeah. Don't don't hold me accountable. Okay, bye. <laughs>